This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. There's only so much truth I can speak in the public domain. To receive completely uncensored information from me, join my completely free email list at CobraTate.com. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be, And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got the top G, man, Andrew Tate. How are you? It's been a while, friend. Yeah, two years. Two years? Is that how long it's been? Yeah. Man, it's crazy how life has changed in two short years. It's only been two years? Two years. Wow. Crazy. Two years, mate. If I, they probably thought that it was me who'd been in and out of prison, mate, but it's yourself. <laughs> <laughs> First time for everything. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah that was an experience. Uh, certainly interesting. I've only ever been arrested once before in my life, and then the second time I was arrested, I had to do a nice long stint in a Romanian jail cell. So that was certainly an interesting experience, but... Uh, all you can do is learn from it and move forward, right? So Yeah. It's no secret. Listen, I've had your back from day one. Yep. I've still got your back now. Yep. A lot of people would have turned their back and yeah, you can kinda of understand that a lot of people are fearful. Yep. When I first met you, what annoys me is when I first met you before the podcast, you had said to me, Do you want to have some fun? I didn't really know what you meant. And you did, you had some fun. A lot of your stuff as comedy and it annoys me when people cut up the clips show those clips is something that you're meaning you yep. genuinely did not mean a lot of the shit you say i've been in your company many times now you're so kind to everybody and this is what i always state you're polite you're kind and you're generous Thank you. always checking in is everything okay yeah for me that's you don't get that now but for do you see how your stuff was all took out of context though yeah well comedy's not allowed anymore is it right so uh, comedy's not allowed and sarcasm's not allowed and you're not allowed to say anything that could possibly be misconstrued as something that it doesn't mean like the world we're living in is just insane And it's crazy because they truly assume people are more stupid than they are. I think most people are very well versed to understand when somebody's making a joke and when something's sarcastic and when something's taking out context. And like, especially, you know what I feel like? I think it's like the English in me because I'm half English, especially the English. That's all we do is take the piss. That's all we do is like say things and exaggerate things and make fun of each other. Americans are all like, oh my God, what did you just say? It's like, that's just our culture. It's how we are. I'm not saying I didn't mean a lot of the things I said, but... It's certainly difficult now to live in the world I live in and that we live in where absolutely everything can be used against you all of the time. It's kind of scary. Did you, did you ever realize how big you would have got the most good man on the planet? Worldwide news yesterday. Did you ever see that vision? <sighs> no. I mean, I knew I'd be big and I knew I had a message. I knew that people would pay attention to it. But the idea that I'd become the most famous man in the world, I didn't see. But I think the reason that's happened is because I've become an anti-hero, but to be a hero, you need to have an enemy. And my enemies have made themselves so visible. And I've also called for a very long time the moves my enemies were going to make. And they continue to prove me right. And when they prove me right, they prove their existence, right? If I sit there and say, the Matrix is after me and the Matrix is going to do this, and then it happens, well, then they prove their existence. So I am now in the middle of a battle, and battles are certainly entertaining. They've always been entertaining. And... I'm not just an influencer. I'm a guy who's engrossed in a battle 
And I think a lot of people find affinity in my message and understand that me fighting this war is in many ways fighting for all the men on earth. It could happen to anybody. So they've made me bigger and bigger. And it's kind of like the, the attempt to shrink me and destroy me has done the absolute opposite. And here I am. What is the matrix to you? It's actually interesting because I get asked that question all the time. But there's certainly a cabal of people who have mass influence over the world who are not people we elect or know their names. I would never kill myself. I'll start by saying that. And I don't have a, a direct beef with these people. That's what's actually interesting. If, if you're a billionaire or you're an extremely important person from an extremely important family and you're born into this degree of power and wealth, you're going to wield it and you're going to use it. That's human nature, right? You can't expect somebody to have that kind of influence and not use it totally respect and understand that. But then I've become massively influential and they see my influence as a counter to their narratives. So as it's always been since the dawn of human time, when you have a counter narrative or a counter influence, you aim to destroy it. This, it's always been that way, right? The English and the Scottish, it's counter narratives and you go to war. So I have a narrative which is countering their narratives that they control and they feel like that I need to be punished for that. And they're massively influential and powerful. And now I find myself in the position I'm in with a matrix attack. And unfortunately, the law is so complicated in most countries on earth for a reason, right? They don't make the law like the 10 commandments. Don't steal, don't kill. Don't, they don't make it simple. They make it extremely complicated and subjective and difficult to understand and you need lawyers and all this. And the main reason for that is one, so that certain people can get away with certain things, depending on what kind of lawyer you have. And two, so that it's subjective enough that it can be used as a weapon. The law can be weaponized. I would argue, even though you're probably one of the nicest men I've ever met, okay. if they were to take the entire book of law and look at it and get legal experts in an attempt to, to hit you with crimes, they'll find crimes. This could be maybe, that could be maybe, this and his friend, that's a criminal group, d d and it's all subjective and they just attack you, it's a weapon. It's a weapon that they use. The judicial system, unfortunately, is a weapon that is used to hurt people when they get to a certain level of influence. And I'm not the only one who's been through it. I knew it was coming. And uh, now I'm fighting for my life. It's quite an interesting scenario. Yeah, it's a crazy scenario. For two years ago, you're relatively unknown. 200,000 followers on Instagram, private planes, girls. Listen, the flash life. Yeah. People bought into it. A year later, you had six, seven million followers. Yeah. We look at Conor McGregor now. We look at Neymar. We look at Johnny Depp. Yeah. Listen, I've been on the front page calling me a woman beater a thug. A woman says I beat her up at McDonald's. Luckily, I had the CCTV to prove my innocence. There was yep. no charges. There was no fine, nothing. Yep. But the paper still went with thug. Yep. I've lost family members to murder. They put my name to question to try and tarnish the name. Yep. I'm only a man who's changed his life and trying to do better. Yep. To interview people to tell things from their story. Yep. Without getting things getting twisted, without all the bullshit of the day. See, when you started, when did, it, when did you realize how big you were getting? From two years ago, like I said, 200,000 followers to then, what was that moment you You know thought? what's interesting? What's interesting is I can tell you that me and my brother had a conversation when I was in Dubai about two weeks before I was arrested. I, I was sitting there with Tristan. We'd just been canceled, right? They, they deleted all our social medias, deleted all our bank accounts, deleted our Uber account, our Airbnb account, our Facebook, our Gmail. We did delete you from everything at once in an attempt to unperson you. And that didn't work. We weren't on person. They made heroes of us and we became more famous than before. And I was sitting with Tristan in Dubai and we're in this beautiful $40 million mansion and we have a Bugatti outside and a McLaren outside and business is going well. And Tristan turns up, he comes in the house and there's like five beautiful girls. And he's like, oh yeah, just, just bring some chicks in, whatever. And the waiters are bringing us drinks and we're smoking shisha and $500 cigars. And I'm sitting there and I said, Tristan, everything's perfect. And he goes, yeah, I know. I said, we're fucked. We're fucked. He goes, why? What do you mean? I said, there's no way. It, it, it does, life doesn't go this way, Tristan. I'm 36, right? There's no way at 36 I could have just made it and it's fine. Something's going to come. He's like, well, you know, we'll be careful. You know, none of us going to die. We'll always roll as a team, all this stuff. We'll up the security and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah. I just had this feeling. I just knew. A week later, I'm in a Romanian jail surrounded by cockroaches. So it's it's like... It's kind of like the balance and the yin and yang of life. I've always understood that whether it's God or the universe or whatever, it doesn't allow you to just climb. Whatever goes up must come down to a degree. And I knew that some kind of attack was coming. I didn't expect to get hit with this. Human trafficking is insane. It's an insane charge. Uh, I expected something else. 
But now that I've analyzed it and I've been through it, I understand they're trying to slander my name. You can't slander my name with a fucking tax charge. Nobody cares. They're trying to slander my name and make out that I'm a heinous, dangerous, de bad person because they've been trying to do that with the media for the last year. So that's what they're trying to do. And I find massive reassurance in the fact that nobody believes them. It kind of scares me that nobody believes them because now it makes me wonder what they're going to try next. But also, it is nice when you're called a human trafficker by the Matrix to wake up and see 10,000 comments of everyone saying, bollocks. It is nice to see that people don't believe it because I would hate for people to actually believe that about me. And, and basically, nobody does. In fact, I struggle to find anybody who does. If you actually look online underneath all these stupid headlines, nobody believes any of it because everybody understands. And yeah, we, we've grown monumentally big and now I feel like I have a huge responsibility and my responsibility is to tell the truth and, and be a good person and make sure I say things in a way that they can't be misconstrued. But also now in this particular battle I'm in, I feel like I'm fighting for the rights of every single man on earth because what they're doing to me has happened to loads of, like you said, famous, influential men. And even worse, not famous, not influential men. How many men are getting wrecked with this garbage that you never heard of? Who knows? I don't know. Do you know? How many? Uh, I had Tommy Robinson on with a man called Mo Rami. He was done for human trafficking and trying to traffic this girl. The girl made it all up. Every single bit of it. She got 12 years just a few couple of months ago. 12 years. She got and she ruined this man's life. This man's son nearly committed suicide because his wow. dad was getting called a sex case. Wow. So it does happen. There was a video just released two weeks ago. A, a, a girl was accusing her boyfriend of beating her up. But there was a video of her hitting herself with hammers. Listen, a lot of the... The majority of the crimes come from men, we get it. But there is some devious people out there. The Johnny case, Johnny Depp case is prime example. Where that guy lost contracts of hundreds of millions for Pirates of the Caribbean because of the accusations that were made. The accusations are just accusations. Charges are just charges. It is innocent until proven guilty. What if I were to tell you one of the American girls who started all this garbage has accused seven other men of human trafficking? Seven. How many times can one person be human trafficked? Do you understand where I'm coming from? And it's, I mean, you're just telling me about the prison time that people who lie are serving. That makes me feel good inside of my heart because I believe that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. It may take time, but in the end, people who lie will pay the price. I believe that. I believe in truth. And I'm very patient. And I know that justice will be done. But yeah, it's absolutely insane. And, and it's insane because, yeah, this is happening to me and the whole world knows about it. But how many men lose custody of their children because they're falsely accused of heinous things, beating the woman or molesting the kids or whatever, right? It's crazy. And yeah, women need protecting. We all agree on that. But I feel like it's a constant balance. The pendulum's constantly swinging and we're trying to find the medium in which women are safe to go to the police and make genuine complaints and that men must pay the price, but also it doesn't go too far and men can't live a life. And I feel like it's swung too far one way. And the bad thing about that is that in life, whenever you have a pendulum that swings too far one way, guess what happens? It swings too far back the other way. People are getting pissed off with this shit. Constant, never-ending lies about men being rapists. Eventually, it's going to swing back to the point where a woman who's genuinely hurt is going to go to the police and they're not going to care. And that's terrible. That's disgusting in and of itself. But then whose fault is that? That's the fault of all the women who keep lying. So we're in this situation. We're trying to find this happy medium and it's insanity. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, if I wasn't world famous, I wouldn't be going through any of this garbage. But that's also the way it works. Because we talk about the matrix and how important people are in charge of the world. You can also look at the world in a far less interesting, more benign way. And I'll give you an example of that. You're a prosecutor. You have a job for the government. You're not particularly well paid. You do a job. And this guy stole a Mars bar. Okay. Do the paperwork. This guy stole a Mars bar. This guy stole a car. This guy stole a car. Who? I don't know. Da, 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 da. Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate. Do you understand? There's, there's a degree of, wow, prosecutors, they, they get hard on for a famous rich guy. It doesn't even have to be from the tip, tip top matrix. It can just be a prosecutor with a hard on because you're famous and you're rich. And it, it's, it's interesting. So this entire battle, there's a whole, there's so much I cannot say as I was learning why this happened to me and why certain organizations and countries haven't saved me when they should have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, they say more money, more problems to a degree. I guess that's true. But I think all men should be allowed to live in relative safety and live a life, which is normal. The things they've accused me of, the human trafficking, which is obviously insane, but look what the BBC print about me. 
The BBC said that 13 years ago, I was emotionally controlling to an anonymous girl. Let's analyze this as professionals. You're a man. I'm a man. All the men watching. Third, if this person exists, which they don't, if this person is not imaginary, 13 years ago, I was emotionally controlling. What does that mean? Does that mean I said, no, I won't buy you a handbag? Does that mean I said, no, you can't go drinking with those guys in the club? Does that mean I said, no, you should have been nice to me on my birthday? What did I do? Don't know. Who is she? Don't know. And they're putting all over the news and call me a sex criminal? How do I defend myself against such abstract bullshit? It's garbage, but they'll do it to absolutely anybody. They could say the same shit to you or any other man watching this. They could say 10 years ago, you were emotionally controlling to an anonymous female. You are the enemy of the state. I used to tell girls I played for Man United. <laughs> <laughs> Take him to jail. Take him to jail. That's not a crime though. Bro, but that's the thing. That's crazy, right? So even with this garbage they're hitting me with, human trafficking. So they come along and they said, oh, you're a human trafficker. I was like, well, I've never transported anyone. I've never kidnapped anyone. I've never restricted anyone. I've never held anyone. I said, no, but you're a human trafficker via the lover boy method. I said, what's that? It's where you pretend to love them. So what, being nice? So I was nice to some girls 10 years ago? Is, is that my crime? I, I, that, maybe I did love them. But we're not together anymore, so what? I pretended? Who said I pretended? Prove I pretended to love. And then what did I pretend to love them to achieve? The case against me is that I pretended to love girls to make them do TikTok for money. Please listen to this. That's the case against me. I pretended to love girls to convince them to do TikTok to give me the money. The girls themselves have said that's not true, but they throw away their statements and keep them as victims in the file. That, that's how insane this is. And they're saying you convince them to do TikTok by pretending you love them. And the reason all this garbage has come up is basically because they chose some girls I know who have TikTok on their phone. And here I am, human trafficker. The level of insanity is crazy. And there's so much more I could say, but unfortunately I'm in Romania and I have to go to court in Romania and I have to respect the Romanian judicial system. And I have enough faith that the judge is going to look at this and say, well, this is crazy. This is not human trafficking. But yeah, you get so big and they, they come for you and they come to attack you. So it's, it's scary. And if they're going to do what they've done to me purely because I know girls with TikTok, I'm sure you know a couple girls with TikTok. I'm sure you guys at home know a couple girls with TikTok. Watch out. It's clown world. What do you think should be in place to protect men more? Do you think we get the rough end of the stick? Oh, we absolutely get the rough end of the stick. And there has to be some degree of burden of proof. I don't know why with these particular crimes, there's no burden of proof. Surely there has to be some legal test. I don't know where a woman's statement alone just is enough. If, I, if you go into the police station and say, I know someone who stole a car. What car? I can't tell you what car. There's no car. There's no video. I can't even tell you the reg plate, nothing. But I know he stole it. Is that person going to jail for stealing a car? They're like, okay, so you can't do anything about the car. There's no video of the car being stolen. No car has been reported stolen. You're just telling me they stole a car. No, go away. It's just this one particular crime. I don't know what the exact solution to it is. I guess, I mean, I have daughters. I have many daughters. And when they grow up, the solution to it for me is going to be teaching them to keep themselves as safe as possible. I believe in personal responsibility for men and women. I don't believe that's a gendered argument. I believe women and men should both be as personally responsible as possible and not rely on government or law enforcement agencies to protect them. If something happened to my daughter, heaven forbid, and I find out, yeah, heaven forbid, bro, but I find out she was walking through a park alone at night at four in the morning. The first thing I'll do is I literally, after, before I plan to kill the guy and find him, because I will kill him, I'll say, what the fuck were you doing walking through a park at four o'clock in the morning by yourself? I'm not going to absolve her of all, all responsibility. I'm not going to sit and sit and go, we live in a society where men shouldn't rape and this is all men's fault and we need more feminism. No, I'm going to say, why did you do that? I would have picked you up. What are you doing? I believe in personal responsibility for all. And of course, there's some scenarios where that won't help. Of course there isn't. But those are the most heinous, violent, brutal crimes where a woman is being responsible and doing the right thing and protecting her safety and is still raped. Well, in those scenarios, most of the men get caught because they're doing actually terrible things. 
But all this subjectiveness of I was with a guy 10 years ago, I was in love with him, we lived together, we had sex, we ce celebrated Christmas together, we had a puppy together, it's now been nine years, and now he's famous, and now he's rich, and I think he once told me something that emotionally made me feel like I couldn't take money from his wallet, and I've been raped, and there has to be, there has to be a level of sanity reinstalled. But that's assuming the, the legal and judicial system wants sanity. If you have sanity, then it's much harder to just weaponize it, right? If you have insanity, then you could just make everybody afraid of it and just weaponize it against anyone you choose. What would you do if you were in charge of the world? How's this been on your daughters and your kids? Yeah, that's the, the worst thing about this. Like, this is not a victimless crime, what's happening to me, because no crime has taken place. And then I'm being persecuted, and that's not a victimless crime. Of course, my brother and I have suffered, but so has my family. My mother suffered, my children have suffered, the mothers of my children have suffered, everyone close to me has suffered. People are suffering because of this. For what? For who? Who are we suffering for? To protect who? People who say we're not victims, this is stupid? Who are we protecting? So yeah, there's been genuine heartbreak and, and a lot of people crying on my side, which nobody seems to give a shit about. Nobody talks about all the BBC and all these garbage and MSN are constantly talk, attacking me, never talk about my, my mental health. They talk about Philip Schofield's mental health, of course, after two days. After a year of attacking me, they don't talk about my mental health. They don't care about my family. They'll just put her address and dox all my family and just try and get everybody in trouble because I'm not part of the club, right? Because I haven't sold my soul. And there's been a lot of people who suffered. And I think that, in fact, in jail, I said it to Tristan. I said, we're sitting here in this hell, but everyone we love at least is taken care of. At least mom can eat, at least the kids can eat, at least the rents are paid. At least we, you know, we're suffering because men are built to suffer, but everyone we love is taken care of. That gave me some solace. But the way they've attacked me, they didn't intend for that to be true. They intended for me to be bankrupt. They intended for me to be completely destitute and destroyed. They intended for me to sit in a cell knowing that I can't feed my kids. That's what they wanted to do. Just because I've managed to make sure that didn't happen, that doesn't mean it wasn't their intention. Their intention is purely and truly evil. And it makes you wonder, who are these people who want to operate in this way? Who are these people sleeping well at night? But uh, I guess the world's always kind of been that way, hasn't it? Seeing you were in Dubai, why didn't you just stay there? Yeah, that's a good question. I, Because uh, truthfully, I love Romania. I've been here seven years. I actually love this country and it's full of good people. And I have to be honest and say that 99% of Romanians I interact with apologize to me. 99%. People on the street police officers, correctional officers, the, the people at the court, everyone's like, sorry, bro. Everyone understands what's happening. They're very sorry. And it's a good country full of good people. I came here to pack a suitcase and I got nabbed. And uh, yeah, I, I, I knew something was up, but I was more concerned about, you know, some Albanian gangsters or something more than the law. Cause I know I don't break the law. It's another really interesting paradigm shift and i think life as you go through it is a series of paradigm shifts it's a series of how it, having your worldview broken and reconstructed but one of the paradigm shifts i'm going through is that as someone who never broke the law really i never really feared law that much because i'm not a law breaker i mean covid to a degree made me understand that you can't be a cuck to the law you have to be the kind of person who's like no i'm not putting that mask on get fucked I understood that much, but I never thought I'd ever be genuinely a target of the law because I'm not a criminal. So I never really feared it. And now I have this really interesting hobby, a new hobby of mine. Before I go to a country, I like investigate the legal system. I'm like what happens if I get arrested? What's the jail like in Azerbaijan? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, what if I get arrested there? <laughs> I, I found out that Japan's legal system's crazy. Jap Japan's got one of the most strict legal systems in the world. They have like a 99.8% conviction rate. You don't get that conviction rate without putting innocent people in jail. If you go to, to a court in Japan, you're going to jail. Listen, go to Scotland then, because God forbid if you ever get to jail, you just put a dress on, cut about in a fucking pair of pants with your balls hanging through and you get sent to a women's prison. The system there is fucked. Wow. Fucking joke. I, a kid raped a 13-year-old and got community service. They're starting to change the law where you get the first one I think it's under 21 for free, basically. It's fucked up. The guy raped two women. Raped two women. Put a dress on. His dick is actually hanging through his shorts. And they're trying to put him in a women's prison. Because this, people were more concerned about his feelings. What about the girl's feelings? And this is the thing that's so amazing to me. So the people who are in charge of the world, the Matrix, and people who are in charge of these countries, they do that. They have no genuine concern for protecting women. Which goes back to my earlier question. Do we want sanity or insanity? 
which is what's scary when you genuinely analyze and say, none of this makes sense. We need to change it. Yeah, that's a very optimistic worldview. It's fantastic to view the world and look at a broken system and say, let's fix the system. It's far more daunting once you understand that the system's broken on purpose. It's designed to be broken. They want to convince the world that I am dangerous to women. Me, a man with daughters, with a large sexual history, with no women with a face even coming forward and complaining, with every woman I know who's ever interacted with me defending me. But then, like you said, they'll take a man and put him in a woman's prison. So do they really care about female safety in any regard? No, they're trying to sow a degree of insanity and subjectiveness into a system which is designed to be bulletproof. The whole point of the legal system and the justice system is that it's black and white, on paper, it's not up to interpretation, the good guys go home, the bad guys go to jail, right? As soon as you ingest subjectiveness and insanity and chaos into that system, well, now you've got a real mess. And that's what we currently have. I would argue that if I was a transsexual, which I'm not, I know I'm, <laughs> that the US embassy would have had me out of a Romanian jail within two or three days. They would have called Romania transphobic and they would have said that my rights aren't being respected and they would have pulled me out. But because I'm a heterosexual male, they just left me there. But you've said it there, everything's a system. As soon as you're born, everything's flawed. Women give birth on their back, which is, is wrong. They give birth under artificial lighting, which is wrong. They yeah. cut the umbilical cord, which is full of nutrients and stem cells, which is wrong. You gave a name, a religion, a race, yeah. you're labeled, you're signing birth certificates. Everything is backwards. Kids are coming out drugged up. Yeah. Everything is wrong as soon as you're born. True. Then you go through the schooling system. You're sitting at the desk, learning the World War Ones and World War Twos. You're not learning about love and understanding of life, money management, fitness, mindset. The just whole system is flawed, but when you've got so much power now, you you can change elections. You're going to become a target. Completely. What do you think about the system? And, and that's the thing. So for a very long time, I've tried to avoid politics. My way to protect myself was I'll avoid politics. I don't really comment. I think most people can guess my politics, but I don't comment heavily on politics. I don't do political shows. I don't comment on politics very heavily. I thought if I avoided that game, because you're right, I can influence an election. I can say right now who to vote for and they'll win. That's extremely scary for me because that means I'm a prime target to kill because that makes me a national security threat. I don't think most people understand that once you're deemed a national security threat, all bets are off. If a government says that is a national security threat, they can kill you in the street. They can shoot you. They can put you in jail without charge. They can uh, spy on your entire life. They can kidnap people close to you and try and convince them to turn. Once you're deemed a national security threat, it's like James Bond. He can go do whatever he wants to the, to the bad guy. It's national security. Once you have control of the entire youth of a country, well, then I guess you are a national security threat. I didn't intend to be. I just say the truth and I find an affinity amongst young men, but they are desperate for me to not have that control. So with that degree of power, I've been very careful talking about politics. I thought, well, let me avoid that game because I don't want to get in too much trouble. Well, and, and, and then I've learned now that if you don't choose a side, you just have two enemies. If, assuming there's two sides at all. Some would argue there's one side. But if there's two sides and you don't choose a side, now both sides don't like you. So it's, it, it's difficult. It's hard. I kind of wish... I kind of wish we weren't living in a world where speaking the truth was so revolutionary that it, it causes a revolution. What if, I, what if I said that so genuinely revolutionary I've said the things that we all grew up with and agreed with 20 years ago. Everything that we grew up with in our childhood about how men, women, how a man should be, things we should do, personal responsibility, discipline, hard work. And I've said it in a convincing way. That's it. It's fucking, it's crazy. So what was the connection with you and Greta Thunberg? Was that any connection or was it just blown out of proportion? I think it was blown out of proportion because that, that was the day I came here to pack clothes and then I got arrested. I think it was blown out of proportion, but Greta is certainly one of the protected class. I don't think many people at home realize, and I'm going to try and explain it as simply as possible, that once you get to a certain level of fame and wealth, the people who are in charge of the world want to also be in charge of you because once they're in charge of you, they can allow you to exist because you'll push their narratives. And for you to join their team, you have to sell your sanity. You have, a, you have sanity inside of your mind. You're a sane person. You're a hardworking person. But you have to take that sanity out and sell it. 
they'll usually give you a large contract for X amount of million for whatever TV station or whatever company or whatever product. You have to take the sanity out of your brain, give them the sanity, and then you'll take the 20 million. And then you'll say, yeah, that is a girl with the balls hanging out of her dress. Put her in the girl prison. You're transphobic. And you have to just sell your, sell your sanity. And then you get to join their team. And once you join their team, you're part of the protected class. And the protected class is protected by basically every institution, but especially the media. Look at Philip Schofield. Guy's a groomer. Se sexual predator. And look, after 24 hours, they're, they're printing photos saying, leave him alone, his mental health, he's on the edge. Poor Philip Schofield. Me, 14 months in, human trafficker, rapist, human trafficker. I haven't even been convicted. Human trafficker, rapist, human trafficker, rapist, rapist in Romania, must go to jail, rapist, rapist, all day, every day. Here's his mother's house. She birthed the rapist. They're attacking me because I'm not joining their team. What most people don't know, and I've tried to make this clear before and I've said it, I've effectively been offered to sell my sanity many times. You don't become as influential as I am with the kind of impressions I get without large corporations becoming very interested in you. I've had very large companies, which I'm not going to name, come along and say, we want, you to we want to sponsor you. We want you to sell our product. You have to tone down your opinions. Don't talk about this. Don't say this. Don't say this. Don't say this. If you're asked about this, say it this way. And we'll give you $25 million and you'll shake the product around. And I said, no, I don't want your money. And they were kind of like, okay, well your decision. Now, if I was sponsored by a very, very large company, those very, very large companies wouldn't allow the media to do to me what they're doing because they'd call the media and say, that's our sponsor. Don't do that. That's our guy. It's all a big club. All I had to do was sell my sanity, James. All I had to do, was cut my balls off, take the sanity out my mind and take the money. But I do believe at a certain point of money, I mean, I'm not going to brag, but there's nothing left for me to buy. There's nothing I want I don't have. So I don't really care about money. What I do care about is I feel good inside when I know I'm telling the truth. I feel good inside when I say what I mean. I feel good inside when I wake up and don't feel controlled, when nobody texts my phone and says, you can't say that. I feel good inside when I feel like I'm helping people. That's worth more to me than money. So I never sold out. And if I had, I don't think any of this would happen. I think this is punishment for not selling my soul. I think that's why they're doing this to me. Yeah, I'm at this stage where I'm only claiming the ladder but I've been offered nowhere near seven figures, but six figures to promote alcohol and gambling. Yep. Everybody who knows my story and watches my stuff know that I'm drinking drug free and gambling free. Yep. Not for life, but just the last five years. Yep. Don't get me wrong, when that gets offered to you, I ain't going to lie, I did think about it. Of course. I thought about it of and course. I thought, then that goes everything that I've worked for, everything that I'm trying to believe in myself and try to help others achieve certain things because a lot of people crave the external stuff to fulfill the internal stuff that's broken inside of them. And part of me, listen, I wanted fame, yep. attention five years ago, because yep. I used to see people on magazines and TV, and I yep. thought, that looks like the life. Yep. And then I interview enough people now to realize that's all bullshit. It is, and it's also delayed gratification. If you would have taken that deal and taken that money, you would have been happy for a week. But two months in, when you hear the story of some poor guy who lost his house from gambling, you feel like a, you feel like a piece of shit. Yeah. And, and so would I, if I did this stuff. I have a conscience. That's the whole thing about this. They have to attack our morality on a level and destroy our, to the point where we don't have a conscience. They, you have to have no conscience to sell your sanity. You have to be a bad person. That's what's so upsetting about my current position. The people who are attacking me are the, are the bad ones. I know in all wars, both sides think they're the good guys, but I have principles and a conscience. They don't have even any of these things. If you, t and we can, that's been proved with COVID. COVID is dangerous. Be afraid of COVID. COVID is dangerous. Be afraid of COVID. Don't talk about COVID anymore. Okay. Anyway, onto today's programming. They don't believe any words they say. They don't give a fuck. They just say what they're supposed to say. They just repeat it like parrots. So they don't have a conscience. They don't have morality. They're just talking pieces. It was the same as the Twin Towers. The, the woman was reporting the tower falling before it had even fell. Bro, I don't want to die. So I'm just going to say, <laughs> I, heard, I heard about that. Very unusual. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. It's, it's insane. So we're living in this post-truth world. And now this is all happening to me. And I'd like to think at least because I have genuinely suffered. I went to jail and it was only for 94 days, three months, just over three months. But I would like to say that Romanian jail is about five times of English jail. We can put it down to like one and a half, maybe two years without charge. In English jail, you get to at least leave the room, hang out with the guys. The lads are all right. That I'm in a, nobody, I don't speak Romanian. I'm stuck in my cell. My cell was about this from, from this table to here. This, this was my room. I didn't leave for 94 days. I don't get to leave. I lived in there with the cockroaches. I genuinely suffered. I went through a lot. And one of the things that gives me solace 
is knowing that I suffered for a reason, at least. And I think the reason I suffered is to wake people up to a, a lot of things about the way the world works. The harder they push this narrative and the less people believe them, the less credibility they're going to have to hurt anybody else. So at least perhaps there's a good side to all of this, right? They've, they're going to try every weapon on me to the point where it's so obvious all they do is lie that this can be very hard for them to lie again. And hopefully it brings some truth and some honesty to the world. And that's, I guess, where I've been trying to find some solace from the uh, experience overall. But yeah, and I'm still in the middle of it, right? It's all just beginning. It's not over because I'm out of jail. I have a long trial ahead of me, which I knew was coming. People were saying to me, ah, they won't charge you. They have nothing. I said, bro, they have to charge me. Oh, but they don't have any evidence. You think this is about evidence? You think this is about evidence? And, and most, people's, uh, most people's idea, when I talk about matrix attack, you know, call me a misogynist. Women don't get it at all. Like, like the girls I talk to. I'm under a matrix attack. Yeah, but you're innocent and you'll have a good lawyer. It's like, that has nothing to do with a matrix attack. That's why it's a matrix attack. If it was about innocent and good lawyers, I, it wouldn't be happening. The judicial system is not always about being innocent and having a good lawyer. Look what they're doing to Trump. Trump's been indicted. Like it's crazy. At a certain level, you get to the point where they just say, get him. Don't care. Get him on something. Get him. And that's it. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter who your lawyer is. It doesn't matter if you're innocent. It doesn't matter if there's evidence. They waited till they had two days left of house arrest because you can only hold me six months without charge. They had two days left and then charged me. How was it being in prison for the first time? Was that a wake-up call? Yeah. How did everything sink in? Shit, this is real. Because there must have been a stage you must have felt untouchable. Money, fame, private planes. They can't go for me. Surely they can't go for me without concrete evidence. Did it really, was that a wake-up call for you when it sank in how deep this goes? Yeah. I, I never felt invincible because I've always understood that there are you can never be bigger than the judicial system of a country. The matrix will not allow anybody to do that. And no matter what country, you could take the most backwards country, let's invent a country, back, backwards land, which is complete shithole. But as soon as you're bigger than the judicial system, you're a national security threat. So nobody can be bigger than judicial systems. So I understood that, but I understood I'd done nothing wrong I didn't think I'd really attract there. I knew I'd attracted attention, but I'd been quite big for a while at this point. So I knew that they'd, I'd probably been investigated head to toe. I've been investigated head to toe a bunch of times. I'm sure I have. And I knew I don't do anything wrong. There's nothing to find, but it is uncomfortable. It is an uncomfortable position. But once, well, like when I went to jail, I can't, I wasn't shocked. Not because I'd done things wrong, but because I knew this was, I, I kept saying it. I kept saying stage two, stage one is they try and cancel me and shut me up and that has failed. Stage two is they're going to try and put me in jail without charge. And when I was sitting in jail, I was like, I knew it. I, I, I just knew it. And you can beat yourself up and say, what could I have done different? How could I have avoided this happening? What should I have done? Hindsight's 2020, right? But I actually think if I analyze my life, even with hindsight, 95% of the time I've made the best move on the board. I've been pretty good that way without being able to tell the future. And even now, as it stands, now that I'm out of jail, am I happy I went to jail? I think I learned a lot in jail. I think I learned a lot. So yeah, I'm not afraid. I'm not a person who's afraid of his emotions. I'm not going to lie to you. I've said it on, even on Twitter. I have nightmares and I struggle to sleep now. I never had that in my life. I'm not afraid of that. I just sit on my phone. I watch TV. I train. I do something, right? I'm not afraid of that, but I do feel like I learned a lot in jail about me and about other people, about how I should structure my life, about things I should do. I think I learned a lot. And perhaps this is part of my newfound religious conviction, but if God is the best of planners, perhaps he put me in there to learn something. I learned some very interesting things in jail, things, personal things, which I can't even say on a podcast, but it's all happened now. And I, I don't see the point in looking at it in a negative way. Could I have prevented it happening by being less fantastic. Well, perhaps, but Nelson Mandela went to jail and Muhammad Ali went to jail and Malcolm X went to jail and MLK went to jail. And when you tell the truth about the world, you're going to do a bit of jail. It's kind of just part of it, I guess. Like I'm trying, I'm trying to make it lighthearted because I don't want to sit and say they put me in a dungeon and left me to rot for no fucking reason. Cause then I get upset. 
So I'm just very much like it's part of the path, it's part of the journey, and I'm glad I'm out, and I hope I don't go back. Getting upset is okay as well because of your character and the masculine, because let's touch on the mental health side, because yep. when you spoke about mental health, it's okay when you've got the private planes, the women and all the money. Yep. You don't you don't suffer. Now I believe, wouldn't say it humbled you, but now I, you believe how 90% of the world feel, 95% up here, because as a man, it's a fucking minefield up here. We oh, don't completely. know. My life is going amazing, but every day I struggle. Every oh, day 100%. I struggle. Got up. Has it made you realise what real mental health is? But you've never failed. You've not quit. You've not broke. You're still yeah. training hard. You're looking. This is the best I've seen you since you got out, because I'm not going to lie. You look like shit. Yeah. But now you you look as if you've got that spark back. Something yeah. is missing its back now, and yeah. I like it. But do you understand mental health now? Oh. I've, I've always been a believer in the struggles men have in their minds and I've always spoke about it and I've suffered with them myself. And this is one of the things when I say like depression isn't real, people say, oh, you don't understand. Let me, let me counter that argument by saying, I understand very well. Me convincing myself and me deciding that depression isn't real is how I prevent myself from ever feeling depressed. And I can, I've only constructed that mental model because I've been in situations in my life where I felt depressed. I'm not saying depression isn't real because I've never felt depressed. I'm saying depression isn't real because I've been very depressed. The people don't understand where my mindset comes from. I understand struggle and mental health and all these things. And yeah, jail was another chance to certainly touch on them because in jail, you can, in, sorry, in real life, when you have my kind of resource, you can distract yourself very easily. If you're sitting around and feel a bit mopey, if I'm sitting here and I'm a bit like, oh, uh, I can literally make a phone call and in 45 minutes be in the air on my way to anywhere on the planet with whoever I want to do anything I want. So you can distract yourself. I'm not saying it fixes all mental health, but it distracts you. Whereas in jail, you are stuck alone with your thoughts. And it was certainly a test of my mental resolve. And I would say that I passed. I, I did well. I, 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 there was never a day where I broke down. There was never a day where I couldn't handle it. There was never a day where I was, you know, I wasn't polite to the staff. I was very nice to everybody. There was never a day I couldn't hack it. It was certainly a test. And also, you know, Tristan said this. I don't want to take his words, but he's true. You go through life telling everyone you're the baddest motherfucker there is. Sooner or later, someone's going to test you. You walk in the pub and you say, I'm the hardest man there is. Sooner or later, someone's going to fight you. Sooner or later. And life's like that. You want to be the top G and you want to go through life and say, I'm the top G. Then God's going to say, well, we're going to see if you deserve to call yourself the top G or not. We're going to put you in a Romanian jail cell. And we're going to leave you there to rot. You're not going to know how long you're in there for. And the biggest mind fuck is I thought I was going to be in there for years. I didn't, I had no idea. Everyone's telling me years, years, years. I thought I was going to be in there for years. So maybe God was just seeing, he was watching me and he was having a look and saying, you want to call yourself top G? Let's see. And I like to think I passed that test. So it is what it is. But yeah, I agree with you. In, in terms of mental struggles, yeah, they exist for all men. And I also think that's one of the reasons I'm so large. I talk about those things a lot. I talk about those things a lot with men and I help men with them. And I try and say to men overall that life as a man is pretty shit and you're going to feel shit for a pretty large percentage of the time but you're only gonna ever escape that if you just perform regardless. You have to perform when you feel bad. As a man, you can't say, I will perform when I feel good. It doesn't work that way because our heads are too complicated and life's too complicated. And there's too much on our shoulders and we have too much stress and too much pressure. Our heads are fucked. You have to be the kind of person who says, I perform regardless. I didn't miss a single day's training. I didn't miss a please. I didn't miss a thank you. I'm not saying I was happy. I'm saying I did exactly what I was supposed to do. Did you have a boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> See, that, this is the Andrew Tate I know. This is the guy I've been speaking to the last two years, the one who's motivational, checks in to see if you're okay. Yeah. Sometimes I maybe regret the first podcast you've done with me because I wouldn't say I antagonized it, but I was up for having the laugh. Yeah. Let's wind up the, the, the yeah. everybody and, yeah. and it worked. Yeah. But it's come back sometimes with a lot of those clips and bit you in the ass. But this is Andrew Tate, I know, the real guy who talks about mental health, who wears his heart on his sleeve, who does genuinely try and help everyone. What's the worst thing about prison? Yeah, the worst thing about prison. The worst thing about prison, I think, for everybody else, because there was a lot of men in there who were crying, a lot of men who were having mental breakdowns. I think it is the problem I didn't have, which is knowing that if you're a normal man, you go to jail and they just pick you up and you go to jail. Who pays the rent? Who's feeding your kids? Who's your wife sleeping with? Like, like, life gets hard for all the external things you could no longer control, things that were your responsibility. I was lucky I didn't have those problems. And when I spoke to people, most people's issues were things that were happening on the outside. And I felt really good knowing that my life is set up in a way where even if I'm plucked from it, it operates. And I set that up because I thought they were gonna kill me. Even to this day, if they shoot me right now, 
everyone around me, everything would be okay. I don't have to exist for my life to function. So that was fantastic about jail. The worst thing about jail, I mean, the cockroaches started off really bad, but after a few days, it's amazing how quickly you get used to cockroaches just in your bed. <laughs> You're just like, oh, fuck. just kick them out of the way. That was kind of bad. But um, not knowing when I'm going to get out, that was bad. Having my name slandered all around the world, that was bad. Not knowing how people are reacting to it. Like the, my first time, month in jail, I didn't know if people believed this garbage or not. I, I had no access to the internet. I didn't see anything. There was a lot about it that was hard, but um, I have to believe it's going to make me a better person. Why else would I, why else did I go? What did I go for? To waste three months? To stare at a wall for three months? Is that why I went to jail? No, I must have gone to jail to become a better person. I must have learned something. I have to self-analyze and find the lessons and pick it out. And I think a lot of people don't do that with all the bad situations in their life, regardless of whether you went to jail or a woman left you or your business failed, whatever it is, you need to analyze the entire situation and say, okay, what can I learn? There's a, there's a big pile of shit here, but there must be a little bit of gold inside. So I've just tried to look at it as a massive learning experience and perhaps that's a coping mechanism, but I've found a lot of lessons which I'm implementing and, uh, and there's a very strong chance they're going to put me back. Not because I'm guilty, because I haven't done anything wrong, but because I'm currently in the middle of a, a, a judicial system. I'm in, I'm in the judicial system of a country. I don't truly understand the language. I don't understand the judicial system. I don't understand the charges against me. I don't understand how any of this can be legal. I don't understand how, where it's come from. I don't understand the evidence they believe they have. And here I am stuck in this process and who knows how it's going to end. How's, how's it been? How do you think it would have been if you were flying solo? Because your brother looking from outside, it seems as if he's going through all this just because he's your brother. Yeah. How would it have been for you flying solo with this? Yeah, I mean, having my brother there was definitely comforting. He was glad he was there because we're a team. That's the thing about me and him. He was like, no, if you go to jail, I go to jail. Right to die. Yeah, 100%. He was like, I'd be furious if you put you in jail by yourself. So that was nice to have him there. And for sure, he's been tied up in all this garbage purely because he's my brother. That's true. It's kind of good to know that even the Matrix see us as a team, not just us see each other as a team, which is kind of nice. But um, yeah, I'm not really too philosophical about it. It's kind of, I don't want to say, it's not very often in my life because I'm the kind of person who tries to prepare his very best and I'm a hard worker and I'm extremely diligent and I like to make sure that everything is organized and I need to do my best to influence the outcome in the best possible way, et cetera. But this is probably the first time in a long time I'm in a situation where it's pretty much it is what it is, right? It is what it is. If the legal system is fair and if Romania does what I believe it will do, because I love this country, which is analyze the evidence and give me a fair judgment, I will walk. If this is a matrix attack, I'm going to jail no matter what. Doesn't matter what I say, doesn't matter what evidence I show, I'm going to jail. So, so what can I do? It is what it is. And we have to see how God has this all laid out for me. And it is scary, for sure it's scary, but I don't think that sitting around being scared of it is gonna help. I think the best thing I can do is the same things I would do if this wasn't happening, which is train hard, work hard, take care of the people who are close to me, love the people close to me, be a good person, help people, smile. What else am I supposed to do? I'm to sit around and fucking mope like a fucking baby? It is what it is. And uh, I truly hope I don't get thrown back in a jail cell. But that's all I can do is hope. Did you ever think you could have get poisoned or killed in there? I was worried about it a little bit, but then I thought, you know, I don't think I'm that close to the end of my chances yet. Maybe this is again, cope. I hope not. I think they'd give me a nice lengthy, I think they'd give me a prison sentence first as a warning before they decided to kill me. If I do get a sentence, which I have to actually serve, I'll be very concerned when I come out and I'm a bigger hero than I've ever been. And that's the problem with my current situation is that my enemy is so incompetent and they don't know what they're doing to the point where, and I keep calling their moves because they're so obviously transparent. This is, not a, this is not a brand new playbook. Hit the famous guy with sexual crime, lock him up. Like this is, this is a st standardized, standard operating procedure. I keep calling out their moves so obviously and blatantly that it's just making me a hero, which is great, I guess, but I need to make sure I'm the kind of hero that can win the battle and doesn't end up in a battle where he has to sacrifice himself. I want to be a hero, not a martyr. I don't want to, I don't want to actually end up dead, but we'll have to see because I'm not going to sell my soul. I'm not going to sell my sanity. I'm going to still say things I believe are true and people are still going to listen to me. 
So we have to see how the world evolves. And hopefully I can change public consciousness and affect the world to a point where truth is respected instead of demonized. How's the women been who was in prison? Have you spoke to them? Are they okay? Yeah, I'm not allowed to speak to them by law, mm -hmm. but they did a fantastic job. I'm so proud of them. And it's such a shame that the, like, they're my personal assistant, Georgiana, and the other one I met at a party once. I don't even know who she is. Barely know her. Didn't even know her name. I thought her name was Ellie and her name's something else. I saw the papers. It's like, who's this? That's Ellie. Ellie, what the? I don't even know her name. They just scooped up people close to me. Insane. And they, they, I'm sure they pressured those girls really hard to flip. And they were like, no, we're not doing it. The boys are good guys. It's kind of like a massive lesson in karma, this whole experience for me. It's a massive lesson in karma because they've called 2,000 people who know me trying to find charges. Everyone from gardeners who used to work for me, ex-girlfriends, everybody, ex-personal assistants, everybody. And because I'm just genuinely pretty nice to people and I'm, I'm pretty fair with people and I'm pretty square with people overall, I had no idea this level of matrix attack was coming. I'm never gonna sit there and go, ah, my pool guy in three years might be able to help me in a human trafficking case. Nobody thinks that way, right? But I just do good things for people. It's like karma. And everybody's been on my side. And I kind of feel like my karma has come back to help me by just being good to people all the time. Even the two girls I put in jail. I mean, one's my PA, but the other one I barely know. But I was so nice. To, oh, hi, that I'm a nice person. Kind of when I see those miserable people, when I see those people who are rude or ignorant or miserable or, you know, in a bad mood or they don't say please, don't say thank you. I always wonder, you know, one day you're going to just bump into someone and you're not going to, and, and that's going to be a judge that you see two years later. And she's going to remember your face. That's it's crazy how the world works. You don't know. I've just been a good person and it's kind of like come back to help me. Well, I just hope it helps me enough to get through this matrix attack and we get through it all. But the information I'm providing to you is the exact kind of information you need to hear day after day to break free from the matrix. This is the kind of information you need to hear every single day of your life. I will provide this information to you for free. You can join my email list at cobratape.com. Yeah, I mean, my rise has certainly been meteoric, and it would be ignorant for me to believe that meteoric rise wouldn't have problems attached. I just didn't expect these particular brand of problems or problems this large. When the shit hits the fan, as cheesy as it is, you know who your true friends are. Did you see this? I learned, I, learned, I learned a lot in jail. You see a lot. I've I, I seen a lot of leeches around you, but I wasn't close enough to ever kind of address it. I tell you, it wasn't my place. Did you see it when you came out? Who's so, your real friend? Yeah, are? so I've always been very smart. I've always known which people on my team are really on my team and which people on my team are there for clout. I've always been good enough. I know which girls love me, which girls love the life. I'm smart enough to be able to tell. I always could tell. But what you learn in jail is then it goes down a level deeper, right? And becomes a little bit more subjective because everybody to a degree is selfless, selfish. Everybody does things for selfish motivations. And that's not a bad thing. Like I give $25 million a year for charity, but I feel good about it. So am I doing it for them? I, well, yeah, I am, but I'm also doing it for me. There's a selfish motivation to do a nice thing. So sometimes I came out of jail and people were amazing to me while I was in jail and they did the right thing and they stuck by me. But over time, their motivations evolved as selfish, perhaps. And I'm not saying they didn't care about me, but they also cared about the things that came with helping me for them. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of, it's a complicated issue. I never really had anybody that close to me who I believed cared about me, who didn't care about me. I already knew who was who. What I did have was people who I thought didn't care about me who proved that they did. I did have a couple of people who I thought, oh yeah, we barely know each other, who did amazing things for me. And I, I, I had a, and I also found some kindness in strangers. Bro, there was a girl, I've still never met her. I don't know who, who would come and sit outside the jail and play me love songs every night. And send me letters just saying i'm the last i'm the hero of the world and all this garbage could you hear her so, uh, yeah she's andrew, <laughs> andrew. <laughs> and she she and i'd say play white snake is this love was stuck in my head when i was in jail don't know why play white snake is this love and she just play outside the jail for me she's from hungary some hungarian girl and she said when all this is over she's going to come see me and but right now she's going back to hungary and she's scared of anyone finding out who she is Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Like that. She cared more about me than some other people I've known for 20 years. She's outside the jail every day. But is she crazy? Is she a matrix agent? 
Who knows? Like, you end up, I don't want to be paranoid, but now I'm sitting thinking, okay, well, that's the ultimate setup, isn't it? For her to come in jail, be nice to me, and me trust her, and then 13 years later, I emotionally <laughs> manipulated her because of jail. I told her what song to play. It's like, ah, my brain's under attack. So you end up kind of semi-reclusive to a degree. And also another thing people complain at me about, like they say, oh, you come out of jail, you don't talk much. If you ever sit in a courtroom and see every message you've ever sent on WhatsApp used against you for the last 10 years, you're going to stop sending messages on WhatsApp yeah, or Signal or, or Telegram. Like, I don't talk on the phone anymore. I'll reply with a thumbs up or okay. Like I'm very, because everything can be taken against you. Even in my second month, we talk about how things can be used against you. After, when I first went to jail, I thought I'd only be in jail for 24 hours. They have no case. How can I be longer? 24 hours, it can hold you, it goes to a judge. Now, everyone was sure. Go to the judge, you go home. Everyone was sure. The judge said 30 days in jail. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Went to the appeal. We're going to win the appeal. So it's only four or five days in jail. Went to the appeal. The appeal said more jail. We're like, we, we couldn't believe it. My legal team couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So I was very sure I was supposed to get out. And I already had booked a doctor's appointment for February 6th. I was arrested on December 29th for February 6th in Dubai. And I called my PA from the jail on the 20th of January because I had court on the 25th. And she said, are you coming to the doctor's appointment? And I said, yeah, I want to come to Dubai for the doctor's appointment. I need to come to Dubai if the judge lets me go. That's what I said on the phone. They took that conversation, edited it, cut it up, and went to court the following month saying that I'm trying to flee the justice system of Romania and flee to Dubai. And the judge agreed and gave me more jail. It's insane that we had the doctor's appointment pre-organized. I said, if the judge will let me go, it's for a doctor's issue. It was all, it was organized in way in November before the arrest. doesn't matter. Everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So uh, it's, it's definitely changed the way I, I interact with people now. And that's, and I don't want to say that I've become paranoid. I, I would hate to think that it's affected my personality, but it has. It has. If I meet a brand new girl now, let's say I meet a brand new girl and she's gorgeous. She goes, oh yeah, we'll talk. I can't flirt and text with her. Like I, I can't I'm like, oh, who is she? What's, what, if, what is this? What if she deletes these three messages and leaves this message and last week's message and this and her message in between? It, it, it fucks with you. So you end up reclusive. So I guess I just talk to less people than ever. <laughs> like I've kind of ended up there because especially till this process is over. And I think that's kind of sad. That, that that upsets me a bit that I can't be myself yeah, but anymore. This, this is the way the world works. You've got to protect yourself now. Yeah. And it's took all this shit that you're going through to realise that. See, when you were in prison as well, when you were getting every appeal rejected, what's then going through your mind? Do you think I could spend the rest of my life in here? They could kill me in here? Because you grew the beard and the hair. Like, why the fuck did you not shave? Was that part of <laughs> my, to look like shit? My war beard. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the beard was kind of like a way for me tra to track how long I'd been in there mentally because, I mean... Count I Monte Cristo. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, 13 years in the Chateau d'If. <laughs> and then the world, my friend. We'll see how it goes. But, um, I mean, the scariest thing about court, and once again, I'm going to actually show respect to the country of Romania and respect the Romanian judicial system and respect the judges. And But it is scary to be in a courtroom where you don't speak the language. That's a unique experience. If I was in court in England, I get to talk. I get to explain what happened. I get to understand what they're saying. I get to counteract the, the prosecutor, et cetera. But when you go to court in, let's say, we didn't have to say Romania, Thailand, Vietnam, China, Russia, anywhere, you sit in the room, everyone starts talking. You're sitting there like a dummy, looking around, and then, okay, jail. What, is that it? Jail. Or at the end they go, yeah, you get a chance to speak, and you stand up and you speak. Does anyone even understand you? Who knows? Who are you talking to? The wall? <laughs> You're just talking. And they're just sitting there going, you don't know. Do they even understand you? I don't know. Back to jail. It is super. It's scary. And um, of course, I appealed to the embassies saying, look, I'm an American citizen. I'm a UK citizen. Help me. But the UK government hates me. The UK government spends billions and billions of dollars or pounds, sorry, trying to convince children that I'm bad. And then they put, of course, they put, sexual education books to eight-year-olds talking about anal sex and all these haram things. That's fine. But I'm the evil one because boys like me that I have a few fast cars. It's, it's crazy. So the UK government hates me. Like the UK embassy wouldn't even come see me. I, I convinced them to come once. Eventually they turned up. I was like, this is garbage. You have to get me out. 
Well, we have a welcome pack for you that explains what happens when you go to jail abroad. So here's your welcome pack. And I only have five minutes. So bye. That didn't give a fuck. I was like, whoa, thanks. It was crazy. What was with the cancer scare? Yeah. So that was the medical thing I had in Dubai. When I got my uh, residency in Dubai, I had a medical check and they identified something on my lung and they, I needed further tests and it was all organized. And that was the thing where they used against me to say I was trying to flee the judicial system, which is insane because I'm not going to, and I'll say this here on the podcast in case anyone wants to know, because I'm sure people are thinking and considering this. I'm not running away from this. I don't think I can run away. I can't be a fugitive for the rest of my life. I'm 36, bro. And I've done nothing wrong. And it makes me look guilty. And I've done nothing wrong. I have to sit and show a judge that I've done nothing wrong. Even if they put me in jail, for my own sanity and conscience, I have to sit and explain I've done nothing wrong and show the proof, show the CCTV. I have video, I have audio, I have all the, I don't have words, I have proof, proof. If someone says he kidnapped me and I show their Uber records of them traveling all around the country and I show CCTV of them walking in and out the house and I show them partying and drinking and I show them being in the country while I'm not in the country because I'm away working and they're going to parties and nightclubs with other people. I have the evidence. I have to show a judge. I'm not going to run away. If that bites me and I end up in jail, then it is what it is. But I, I must, I gotta believe that God loves truth enough to save me from this. I can't believe that I'm going to go to jail for this complete garbage. What was it like getting out? Was that a relief? No, because getting out of jail should have been a relief. But I guess also with me, and I'm not complaining because I'm not the kind of person who complains, but my life, I'd like to say that my life is probably 20 men's lives. My life is extremely busy and large. I have a very big life. I have children, different mothers, and I have 110 people who work for me and seven companies and 15 houses and 40 cars and planes and boats. And the, so I have a lot that happens. Like all day, every day, all I do is work. My life is work. I wake up, I start training. I'm on my laptop all day, every day. And people say to me, what work are you doing? And I say, I'm, my life is a job. I'm organizing my life. By the time I make sure that everyone's fed and everyone's paid and the cars are clean and the boat's where it's supposed to be and my upcoming appointments are organized and I manage to look after myself and train a little bit, the day's over. I don't have any time for leisure. So when I got out, the backlog, and also I'm, I guess I'm an OCD kind of person. So the backlog of 92 days of disappearing was pretty substantial. So I, I got out and I, I'm, con I'm calling everyone. What happened with this? What happened with that? What happened with this? I need this. Give me this paper, this, this, this. And I found myself, I got home from jail at maybe one in the morning here. And I sat on my computer for maybe 30 hours. Didn't move. 30 hours just on the laptop. Just, just trying to find out what happened with my life. Process. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's interesting because... I never thought I'd say this because I'm from Luton. I'm from a council estate. <laughs> but like, I'd be like, I'd be like 15 hours in and I'd remember, oh yeah, there's $4.2 million. Where did, where did that go? Where was that sent? Where, where was that money? Where was it? Did it bounce back? Like, like just money and cars and like, did it, and I just sit in the type of the computer and I was probably more stressed than I've ever been. <laughs> I'm sitting here with my beard stressed. And I hadn't been on a computer in so long, I forgot how to type. So all my messages to people are just fucked. But yeah, it was, it was crazy. And I, I kept saying, you know, to Tristan, because Tristan's the opposite of me. He's like, Andrew, relax. We just got out of jail. It's fine. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me a week. And when it's all under control in a week, I'll just, we'll chill. And still to this day, I'm doing the same thing. I'm still stuck on the computer. But um, yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say getting out of jail was particularly, I wouldn't even say it was relief. It's weird. It's so weird the way the human mind works. If, you're, if you were in that little submarine at the bottom of the ocean, you'd do anything to not be in that submarine. You'd do anything to not be in that submarine. But all the times they weren't in the submarine, they didn't care. Isn't that amazing? You'd do anything to not be in jail. I'll do anything to not be in jail if I can just get out of jail. And then you get out of jail, a few months go by. It's like another day, isn't it? Isn't it crazy how ungrateful humans are? Think about it. You talked about mental health. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about how massively ungrateful the human mind is. Something, heaven forbid, something bad happens to a family member. You'd do anything to have them back. How often do you call them? Yeah, a couple you of just, times a week. You just don't. That. Yeah, you just don't give a shit. It's so weird. Jail did give me a few things which I 
am super thankful for and will always be thankful for. And I made sure in jail, I said, I'm not going to allow myself to ever be ungrateful for these things again, like a cold drink, because it was getting cold drinks was nearly impossible. And I got a cold one. It was a completely different scenario or even hot water. You could get hot water once a day for tea. And I was arrested in January. It was freezing. But I had hot water, like a hot water bottle. I'd make the most of it. I'd hold it for a while and then I'd make a tea and then hold it for a while. So there's certain things now that even when I put the kettle on, I'm like, yeah, okay, hot water is gangster. I like hot water. But in general, yeah, it's kind of amazing how life goes on to a degree. I guess it has to. I guess that's how the human mind adapts. So. Who was it being away at Christmas, New Year, away from the family, the ones who love you the most? The worst thing about the New Year thing is I, me and Tristan were having this long argument about what we're going to do for New Year's. We were sitting there planning it like arrogant millionaires. Let's go to Vegas. No, it's too far. We got this party in Dubai. Yeah, we got this party in Dubai, but I heard Dubai, the traffic's shit. Uh, New Year's. We can go to Bali. I don't want to fly that far. Like we're sitting there like arrogant millionaires complaining about all these options we have all around the world. And then New Year's, New Year's Eve rolls around and we're in a Romanian jail cell <laughs> with, with cockroaches. <laughs> it's like the ultimate punishment from God for, for sitting there going, this will be boring. That'll be boring. And I'm just sitting there looking at the cockroaches on the wall and the song that was playing down the hall, the guards are playing some, do you remember the catch up song? Do you remember that song? Mm -hmm. Hey, ha, ha, hey, ha, hey, 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 It was everywhere for a while. That was on the speaker way down the hall. And there's that song and cockroaches. And I, I saw the fireworks go as it, as it struck 12. And I was kind of like, and my first thought was, I hope I'm not here next new year. You know, it's like, is this the first of many? I don't know. It was scary. I'm not going to lie to you. It was scary, but it was a test, I guess. Why do you think we take life for granted? Because when my father passed, he seen me at my worst. He seen me just out of prison, addict, smoking weed, and he was dying with leukemia. And when they used to go for meals and stuff, I don't know if I was ashamed, but I used to sit in and gamble and just smoke joints. I missed the last few months of his life because I felt like a bum instead of being a man and taking the reins and my family's going to be fine. I gave my mum extra worry. Yeah. Who's already lost two brothers to murder, who lost her husband to leukemia. Wow. Her son was a fuck up. Wow. I never, now I'm a man now, I understand life, but I still struggle and I still have, because when I'm happy, I think about my dad because he always knew the man that I could be. Yeah. He never seen that. He seen me dying saying, look son, you need to get on with your life and, and it fucking breaks my heart. But I know you speak highly of your dad. What do you think your dad would be saying with you going through all this stuff? And yeah, I guess that's probably a huge source of strength for me is that I have his last name and I have to make him proud. And if he's watching over me, then I have to make sure that I act in a way that he's going to be proud of me. And I guess that's a, a duty which is instilled inside of me, a duty I have to my ancestors, and I draw massive strength from that. And I think he'll be very proud of me for everything I've done because I've stuck to the morals that he's given me. In regards to why do I believe humans are ungrateful, I think we're designed to be ungrateful because that's the only way we achieve anything. Because otherwise we become extremely complacent with the basics. If the people you care about are alive and you have food, why do anything else? Why do you even want a fast car? This is a genuine question. Why do any of us want fast cars? It's, there's speed limits and they're a headache. But we want one because no one else can have one. Why, do, why did Alexander the Great conquer all? Why did he conquer as much as he conquered? Why didn't he just take the town and say, oh, I've got a few women, I've got the town, I've got the town square. It's enough, isn't it? No, we're genuinely going to be ungrateful for everything that we actually have that we hold dear because it has, especially men, because we were evolved to a degree or there's something inside of our mind that want make us want more and more and more and more. This is how we operate. And all men are the same. There's no subscriber number level. There's no subscriber number you'll get to where you say that's enough. You'll say, I'll oh, just get a little bit more. Greed. Same with money. Greed. Yeah, it's greed. We're greed. If you're appreciative of the things you have, you're not greedy. And maybe some people are. There are people who are extremely appreciative for the things they have, but then nobody knows their name. The people whose names you can mention are the people who, to a degree, have that burning desire inside of them that can't be satisfied. Why do I have to be four-time kickboxing world champion? Why is one not enough? Right? Why did Conor McGregor need two belts? Why is one not enough? Like All the men you can name had that inside of them. So to a degree, you're going to be slightly ungrateful for things around you until you lose them. What do you think that is? Look, feed them bread and water and they will be distracted. The people who get paid the most on this planet is people who distract the most people yeah. without living their own life. Sports teams, film actresses, actors. Yeah. Because people are distracted. People do genuinely go home and watch their TV and they're just programmed yeah. not to achieve anything and it's sad. It's not that they're bad people. It's just all they know. Why do you think 
this happens? Why do you think people are so dumbed down that they can't open their eyes and see the world a bit differently? But, but I think it's breaking. I, I think the internet has broken it. I think to say maybe 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago, it was at the height, the height of the mind control of the populace. But I actually think we're in the middle of a spiritual revolution. I think that if you were to go and ask, if you were to go 10 years ago and ask people on the street, does the news lie to you? Maybe 20% would say yes and 80% would say no. But I think it'd probably be around 50-50 now. I'd like to believe it's around 50-50. Most people are starting to understand that everything is a fucking lie. It's all a lie. It's all programming. It's all garbage. And the internet has given all these different points of views and different, and, and I think MSM is becoming defunct. I think it's becoming less interesting. I'll say right now that me and you will sit here in this room with a few cameras and millions of people will watch this. More than watch most, more than watch Newsnight. It's crazy. So the world is changing and, and what they're going to do to counteract that, I'm not entirely sure. Perhaps they're going to try and snipe particular characters who won't become controlled opposition. I don't know. And try and take them out and throw them in a Romanian jail cell. We're going to see. What do you think life is? That's a good question. And we can answer it from a very boring way. We can talk about it that we have a responsibility to reproduce and we should have children. But I think life is many different stages. And I think that at the beginning, especially, and for a long period, you learn. You do learn the whole way through life, but you, you learn. And once you've learned enough, I think you get to a stage, and I'd like to feel like I'm almost there. Maybe you're 30, maybe, maybe at end of your 30s. You've learned enough to implement all of the lessons and, and live a good life. And then I think once you get older, let's say 60 something plus, you don't live for yourself anymore. You live vicariously through the people you care about. That's what I believe. I think that by the time I'm 60, I'm gonna be more interested in what my kids are doing than what I'm doing. Maybe I'm wrong, I'm not 60, I'm just guessing. But I think that's what life's all about. I think it goes through different stages and I've never really seen, and the reason I say this is, the old people I know who are on their deathbeds, they're only sad to die because they're gonna miss me. They're not sad for themselves. I don't know if you ever noticed that. They're like, I'm going to miss you. Uh, what are you going to be? Okay. They're worried about you. Like there's, they're, so, they're living through you so much. They're so vicariously living through you that their concern is for you. They don't even, they've lived enough. So they kind of get to a point where like, well, I don't want to live. I don't care about me, but are you going to be okay? It's kind of weird, but it was the same thing for me in jail. I'd call my mom and say, are you okay? Is this okay or that? And she goes, I can't believe you call me from a jail and I'm trying to ask if you're okay. And you're saying I'm fine. And all you care about is me. Yeah. Cause I'm my man. It's kind of what I'm supposed to do, right? Take when care I, of you. Yeah, when I was in G prison at 22, uh, my mum used to come and visit and I was in a place called D-Hall, but I could see out the back and I had that pop a boxer dog and she used to bring him up. My dad, my dad got diagnosed with leukemia, but I used to always put on the brave face and it, fuck, it still breaks my fucking heart thinking about it, that the torment, because we're the, we're the babies, yep. we're the sons. Yep. yep. And that's what makes me, I just retired my mum two weeks ago and uh, it's been four years and that's, what she deserves yep. as a man you want to be alpha we can talk about masculinity you taking care of your family is the most alpha thing you can ever do in your 100%, fucking life 100 percent. more alpha than any fucking lamborghini or any garbage that's one the first morning. thing you should do yeah first thing you should do is take care of people that's actually one of the things i think is most broken about western society when i see these like nursing homes and stuff or just people just fobbing their parents off or or kids arguing over who gets the money from the parent when the parent's dead like the, the, when the parent's still alive and they're all fighting over it so i just didn't feel like I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm the oldest Tate now that my dad's gone, but I feel like I have a responsibility to take care of my mother and everyone close to me. And I think that men are givers. And as a man, you're going to feel happiest if you're giving. I think we're built to give anyway. If you look at a man who's depressed or really sad, I don't think a lot of them are giving as much as perhaps they should. Or if you look at a man who doesn't have the capability to give. But if you take a man, you put him in an important position. And let's say even me. 110 people rely on me for a wage. I, I feed thousands of children around the world every single month. I feed kids. It's tapepledge.com. You can see I feed kids in Somalia and Turkey, the earthquake I was feeding children. If, if I feel like shopping and spending money, I find myself buying shit for other people. I, I don't want it for me. I have everything. I like to see it really is better to give than to receive. I think that's the masculine. The true masculine role is to give things and to make, and the feminine role or the subservient role for a child is to be grateful for it. I think even a relationship is better that way. I love to like have a woman and she can be a spoiled princess as long as she spoils me back with unlimited gratefulness. I want to be, I'm not gonna have an entitled ungrateful woman, but if, she, if she's extremely grateful, I like to give. I don't want her to buy me stuff. 
it's not interesting to me. When Christmas comes, what do men say? I don't want anything. We don't care, do we? We don't want this yeah. stuff. So I think the masculine is giving anyway. And you're right. And, and that's what makes you feel better as a man and happy inside of yourself. And that's one of the things, like I said, gave me the most solace in jail. Every time I heard or spoke to any of the other guys in there and they're talking about the problems they had outside, I was like, you know what? Everybody who has ever relied on me, I haven't let them down. Even though the matrix has thrown me in a cell, I still haven't let them down. I'm glad I was paranoid enough to set myself up that way. And I'm at the point now where I, I don't even have a bank account. I don't have anything. I don't own anything. I don't own a house, don't own a bank account, don't own a car. I don't have social media. <laughs> I have a Twitter account. That's it. <laughs> I don't have anything. Like I, I, so I've done that particularly and deliberately so that I could be killed. How much is social media playing a big part in people's sanity? Because I see a lot of women and men arguing now, masculine energy and feminine energy. For me, it's old school. I'll provide and protect. Yep. I don't drink. I don't want my missus drinking. Yep. I want my missus to be with the kids. I believe when you give birth, like even skin to skin on kids is so important. Yep. A lot of people, and some women need to go out and work in two and three jobs and put their kids to nursery. Yep. I understand it, but for me, the women should be having a loving home and 100%. nice cooked meal. The man goes out and for me, listen, I've done a lot of shagging back in the day. I'll, I'll say it here. I have. Like, that's all I love to do because I was externally looking for something yeah. to fulfill the brokenness that was in me. Yeah. I'm all about one woman and I, I love that woman and yeah. I'll protect her. Listen, when men, men get urges, men look around, but I believe in soul ties. I believe in sexual energy exchange and 100%. I believe that can damage your frequency. And this is why these conversations are so powerful because the shit that you used to say five years ago, two years ago, three years ago, people can change the way they see the world. Yep. People can make mistakes and go, do you know what? Mm, okay, I understand. I was a bit naive then. Yep. I was doing it to for the cameras and I was doing it to cause uproar, which happens. But for me, it's to learn from my mistakes. It's took me 39 years to kind of understand life. I struggle with eating. I love sugar. Yep. Uh, but I'll create an excuse to go, I'm not doing anything else, so I'll overeat when I shouldn't be really because I want to be leading for exa an example for my sons, yep. my daughter, and and going, my dad is doing it. We're in here in Romania. We've came to your house and we're, we're grafting to yeah. create change and give freedom. Interviews like this gives my mum her freedom. Yep. Met mortgages paid. Absolutely. She's getting wages. So I thank every guest that's come on my show, but I wouldn't have be able to interview people without going through the misery and torment and making mistakes. 100%. And I'm sorry a, a lot of destruction I've caused in the past. I genuinely am. And I try yeah. and reflect on a lot of stuff, but sometimes it can damage the brain. Now it's all about learning from that, becoming a better person yeah. because people do change. Yep. Do you feel as if you're going through a process where you're understanding the, the influence you have now? Yeah, that's that's the biggest change I've learned. So I'm not saying the things I said a few years ago, et cetera, I didn't mean. I'm not saying I I'm not saying that because I said things and I would say them with half context, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd say, yeah, there's me and there's three girls in it. But I wouldn't also mention that there's three girls, but I only love one of them. I'm only in love with one of them, and two of them are just there for the photo. I wouldn't mention those things, right? So I'm not saying I lied and I'm not saying I didn't mean the things I said because I did. I left some context out, but with great power comes great responsibility. It would be foolish for me to sit here and say, now that I'm the most Googled man in the world, I can talk the same as I could talk when nobody knew who I was. That's just dumb. So now I do feel like I have a massive responsibility on my shoulders. And then when you understand you have a massive responsibility, you say, okay, what am I gonna do with this? What's my actual mission? What am I trying to achieve? And I'm trying to make the world a better place. And I do think that to a degree, some of the flash and the, and the sex and the women and the cars and whatever is part of that. Because if you want to teach teenage boys how to grow into men, they have to want to be like you. And what do teenage boys want? <laughs> to a degree, right? You, you can't say, here's me, Mr. Boring, here's how to live, because they're not going to listen to you. Because everyone's already trying that. And that's why they're so lost, because they don't have a hero. So a hero is going to have that element to him for sure. But yeah, I mean, what you're saying about one woman, absolutely. Like when I went to jail, you lose, you lose absolute respect or any desire for women who won't send you a letter. Oh, we're cool when I'm outside. We're cool when life's good. I go to jail. You don't send me a letter. And then I come out of jail and they're like, I missed you so much. But you didn't send me a letter. Didn't, you didn't find time. Three months. Oh, I didn't know how. Randoms worked it out. <laughs> so randoms were outside playing love songs. Where the fuck were you? Oh I, oh, I missed you. Bollocks. So I've lost a lot of respect for certain people. Sure. And then when the respect goes, the attraction disappears. And then I've gained a lot of respect for others. And then that makes the attraction stronger. You've won? Yeah. Because it's filtered out the rats. It's filtered out the bullshitters. Absolutely. 
what I, what do you think now is a good relationship for me? Because I'd done all the fucking about, I, yeah. I made so many girls cry and yeah. broken hearted. I says I love them, but I didn't. Because for me personally, if I cheat on someone, oh, lover boy, human trafficker. Yeah. Because <laughs> if I cheat on someone, me personally, I don't love them, and if they take me back, I don't think they love themselves. So both are losers. Obviously, certain religions you can have four yeah. wives and you can have different yeah. partners. I get that. And if a woman's happy with that, so be it. Who's yeah. who's to judge? But for me, it's just. It's just try it because relationships are fucking painful. Yep. They're hard. I've never got by three months. This is my longest relationship. Yeah, yeah. And I feel the pressure. I don't mind. I can go and sit in a, a house full of gangsters, interview them without no sweat. Yeah. My my missus gives me shit for not picking up my socks and I start yeah. sweating and think, the man thinks she'd be saying, who the fuck are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, and yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relationships are hard. They are. Communication is key. I get it. I'm still learning. Yeah. But what do you think makes, what do you think the ingredient is for a good relationship? Yeah. And that's a really good question. It's interesting how you just said that about the masculine inside of you, because I think every man deals with that battle, right? We want to make her happy and we want to provide to her, but also we want to be respected. And it's a fine line that we have to walk in regards to making her happy and fulfilling her wishes. But also we want to feel respected. We want to feel like we have a degree of control. I do think that a man is happiest when he does have control. And I'm not saying control in a negative way. I'm saying that to a degree, he wears the trousers and he provides and he takes care of her and he pays the bills, etc. I think traditional gender roles exist for a reason. I don't think they've come from nowhere. I think that humans naturally fall into their gender roles when life is very difficult. And in olden times, life was much more difficult, so gender roles were much more defined. And now life's become a bit easier. They've tried to become blurred. But certainly a good relationship is where a man's a man and a woman's a woman. And there is a mutual respect there. And I think that, I mean, I don't struggle to have happy relationships besides the one thing you perhaps just said. Sometimes they'll be complaining about something and I'll know they're right. But I'll be like, who can't complain at me? I'm the top G. <laughs> and I have to be like, you know what? You're right on this one. I'll give you this one. Yeah, I'm a control freak. Yeah. I believe I'll guide my family into an amazing life of understanding and only have the best intentions yeah. for them. My girlfriend's made many decisions and they've been fucking terrible. I'm going to state that. Yeah. I, I yeah. love her to bits. Yeah. I don't always get it wrong. I can be moody and crap. But yeah. the pressure on a man's life is unbelievable. I'm the breadwinner. The pressure on trying to be a good father to different kids. I tweeted and, something. You just reminded me of something I tweeted. And maybe you'll disagree with this, but I tweeted it. I said that most successful men are in pretty much the same mood all of the time. We always have the pressure of empire in the back of our minds. We might be a little bit happier some days, a little bit sadder other days, but basically we're always in the same mood. And the woman decides the mood overall. If she's particularly happy, then we can all be happy. If she's moody, we're all moody. But I don't think it's us. Do you agree with me? Yeah, we're, the, with we're in the same yeah, mood. She controls the mood in the mood. You moment. control yeah. the mood in the house. You control the vibe. So if you were to say to me, like, what's a woman's primary job? Your primary job is to set a good vibe and a peaceful tone and to be happy. Mm -hmm. Like, I would put happiness above anything. I'll tell you right now, if you were to say to me, Andrew, do you want uh, a miserable, intelligent woman or a happy idiot? I'm like, how happy? <laughs> 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 well, you mean smiling all yeah. the time? Yes, yeah, smiling all the time. Oh, cool. I'll, t I'll take that. Hi, baby. Oh, hi. Oh, do you want coffee? Yes, I do. Thank you. Yes, I do. And I, I take that. I think the woman's in charge of the vibe and the atmosphere of the house because whenever I've had women say to me, you're in a bad mood. I, I'm never in a bad mood. I'm always in the same mood. You're now attacking me and you're saying a bad mood. Just, you just smile and everything will be fine. You're saying that puts you in a bad mood. I'm the same. I'm up at 5 a.m. I'll start work. The morning she wakes up, whatever that tone is, but in my mind, I can get insecure so because if I feel as if something's wrong with her, I think it's me. Yep. And then I say, is everything okay? And then she'll say, oh, but it's you. Yeah. And I'm saying, but it's not me. I'm just making yeah, sure yeah, you're okay. Yeah, so yeah. my mind fucking goes. Yeah. And then that creates an argument. 100%. I'm up working 100%. for us to provide us a great life. 100%. Men are always in the same mood. And yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean. And they are tough. It is difficult. But, and it's amazing because like we look at a romantic relationship, we have all these problems. Whereas me and my brother, we never argue ever. Why is that? I don't. To try and decipher how perfect our brotherhood is, I'm not entirely sure, but I can't think of the last time I was just in a bad mood and arguing. It's just never, just never. It's so easy for us to get along. We're just like this. We just never, we never, ever, ever, ever argue. But um, yeah, it's really interesting you say that. But I, that's where I think respect comes in. If I think of the best relationships I've had or the best women I know, they understand their job is to be happy. 
That's their job. That's their objective. That's their goal. I'm going to be smiling and I'm going to be happy. Even if I don't feel it, I'm going to be happy. And I've had women say to me, you know, Andrew, you're dealing with so much. I just want to be your cheerleader. And I said, that's exactly what you should be. And that's exactly what I need. And you will be rewarded significantly. So just cheerlead. And, and, that's, and I think that it can work on every level. I think if a woman is her man's cheerleader, she's going to have the best man she can possibly get. If even doesn't matter what he does, he can, no matter how mundane and boring his job or whatever, if you wake up and, and cheerlead him and say, you do such a fantastic job and just make him feel respected and important, you're going to have a fantastic man. He's going to be very happy with you and he's going to be very hard to replace. So I think it's, it can be as simple as that, but life's not always simple, is it? So you get out of prison, house arrest, kind of going through the motions and then all the accusations then come to charges. Yep. How's that then go through your mind? What's, what are you thinking then? Yeah, so I knew charges were going to come. It didn't surprise me at all because you can't make a song and dance this big and then drop it. Imagine they dropped it. Everyone would go, wait, whoa, whoa. You put the man in jail? Where are the victims? Who? You can't just invent human trafficking. What, what do you mean you drop it? What do you mean there's no case? You can't just drop it. They had to try and charge me. Also, there is, there's legal repercussions I could take for false imprisonment, right? So they have to charge me. So I knew it was coming. I'm not surprised by it. Uh, the charges came. I went to court yesterday to find out if my house arrest will be extended. I find out tomorrow morning. So maybe by tomorrow morning, I can leave the house for the first time in 188 days. I have not had a day of freedom. That'd be interesting. But perhaps not. Perhaps they're going to extend my house arrest and deem me a public danger and I'll be stuck here. I don't know what's going to happen. But I knew the charges would come, but I'm actually quite happy that the charges came because it's the first chance I get to display my evidence. Up all the way up to this point, every time I went to court, it wasn't about the case. It was about whether I should be detained as the investigation goes on. That's a different argument than the case. So it's very interesting because you stand up in the front in the court and you're like, I have all the evidence I'm innocent. They're like, we don't care if you're innocent or guilty. It's nothing to do with the case. This is about should you be detained as we investigate you? And you're for rich and you can run away. So yes go to jail. It's frustrating. This is the first time I get to actually show my evidence. And I don't see how a judge can disagree with what I'm going to say and show. It's, it's pretty black and white. What do you think will happen? Well, that's an interesting question. And I have to show, once again, respect to the country of Romania. And I'm going to stay in Romania no matter what when this is over, whether I win or lose. I'm not going to leave this country. I'm not going to run away. My brother has Romanian children. I have Romanian nieces now. We have a lot of Romanian houses. Our life's here. We've been here a very long time. I believe I'm going to be found completely innocent because the evidence that we have is more than substantial. It's, it's insane amounts of evidence that show that we're completely and utterly innocent. I believe we're going to be found innocent. I believe that God, uh, like I said, the moral arc of the universe bends towards truth. I think Martin Luther King said that. It just takes a while. Sometimes you look at the world and say, it's all just run by falsehood and lies. But I think the moral arc, although it's long, in the end bends towards truth. It's hard to hide truth forever. And the truth will come out and will be exonerated. And I look forward to that day and repairing my reputation and getting back to my normal life and just looking at this whole, ex this whole saga, this whole story and taking the lessons from it and trying to be the best possible person I can be, protect myself for the future the best way I can and uh, go from there. And if it goes a different way, if I end up in jail, well, then I'll see you outside playing love songs. Don't I? <laughs> <laughs> see, when you were going through all that, uh, you've had a lot of controversy with big other YouTubers and stuff like that. True Jordan being one of them. He's yeah. had run-ins with Tyson Fury, Conor McGregor just yeah. recently. How did that beef start with you and him? Yeah, that's, that's old, old, that beef. Um, and, and truthfully, I held nothing against the guy. I don't have any real grudges against these people. But sometimes, uh, unfortunately, the nature of the internet, when everyone's trying to get attention, is people say and do dumb shit to get attention. And he started a beef with me when I had a Twitter account long ago, when I had a webcam company, and he was saying that all the girls who work for me are whores and all these things. And I just replied to him saying, listen, there's a whole bunch of girls who saw you calling them whores, and you don't know who these people are, and that's quite misogynistic and sad. You shouldn't be calling a bunch of people you don't know names. They have children, and some of them have husbands, and you don't know who they are. So it kind of started there. So he started it. He was particularly aggressive, thought he was a tough guy. And then only a week later, all those screenshots came out. So I had to, I had to mention it. Like, come on. Like it's, when God gives you a gift like that, you're like, okay. So I ran with that for a while. 
So he didn't like me. And then when I converted to Islam, he said I should blow myself up like all Muslims blow themselves up or something. And he lost all his sponsorships and got in a lot of trouble for that one. Stupid thing to say. Um, but it is what it is. I have, no, I have no real genuine beef with him. I can sit here and make fun of the guy, but beef over what? I don't really care. I mean, there's in, in the world, there's people... I, I do have enemies in, this, on, in the world, and I do know who they are, but they're not on social media. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's, the, This YouTube shit is amateur. It's, no, it's kind of below me. No, it is because of all the shit you've been through. And in general, it's, I mean, even when, even when I see this YouTube shit, even when, like, when Jordy was complaining about, he's a Muslim and he's beefing me, that I'm kind of like, I don't want to say too much on this podcast, but like, I'm living in Romania and I'm affluent, and I think people here are smart enough to understand what I'm saying. I have real enemies. You think I'm interested in some YouTube beef? Like if I had an actual problem with him, he'd be it'd be over. Like there would there'd be no more YouTube channel for him. Like it, I don't give a shit about this YouTube beef and this clicks and beef. And he made a video, I'll make one back. It's gay. Yeah, it's kind of it's shit. gay. It's it's kind of so shit. gay. Like if you're just gonna sit there, and it, like if he's gonna make videos at me, like, you're you're just gay. What about the Jake Paul stuff? Was that close to being a fight? Or was that just for media hype? Yeah, it was on the cards for a while because they kids KSI, Jake Paul, Logan Paul. They get a lot of stick, but fair play to them for creating what they've created and making millions. I like that they brought back the the idea of dueling someone you don't like. Don't like me? Fight me. I actually kind of like that. Yeah, you can respect that. You can respect that. KSI's an idiot. Logan's an idiot. Jake is actually quite a nice guy. I met Jake, and he's actually quite a nice guy. I wanted to jump back in there and teach him all a lesson. Uh, and there were some fights on the card, some big fights for me organi being organized in November. And I, I, I said to them, look, I don't give a shit about PPV and gate tickets that I want X amount a million up, up front, expecting them to say no. And they're like, okay. I was like, all right, well, it's a lot of money. So it was all organized. And then I went to jail. So now it's all off. The, I mean, this, this, this trial might last two or three years. Then I'll be 40. So then it's pretty much too late, which is a shame because at 36, I could still do it. I could still, I could still teach them all a lesson right now, but fair play to them. I mean, they're young guys and they're getting attention and they're bringing life back into the sport of boxing and it's good. I, I have a slight suspicion it, it might die down soon if they don't get some better matchups, but overall I wish them the best. And I think it's better to be training hard in boxing than what did they do before? Put on Pokemon costumes and dance around like clowns, which fucking idiots. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this is the thing with most influencers. I, I can't, it's kind of interesting because I've become the biggest name in, or one of the biggest names in online space, but I can't, I don't know much about most of this other online stuff. I can't watch it. Someone said to me, hey, this big Twitch guy said this about you. I'm like, Twitch? What the, okay, Twitch. I know what Twitch is. Who the fuck watches Twitch? Who watches Twitch? I go and I, I click on the account and it's thousands of idiots watching a video game. Like, I, it's just asinine. It's brain dead garb. I don't know who these people are. Influencer, you, you look up an influencer on YouTube and look at what the shit they're doing. Look at their, I wore a Pokemon costume and bought Pokemon cards. LOL. It's just, Crunch yeah, up. bro, it's, it's, yeah. it's so embarrassing. I can't watch any of this shit. So at least they're boxing instead of doing that crap. The big thing converting to Islam. Yeah. For me, religion, I've always skeptic of it. There's so many religions, so many gods, but the Muslim yeah. community is the fastest growing community on the planet. Yeah. The Muslim community is it's so strong and if they've got your back yeah. they've got your back one million percent a lot of people might have said to you it's a power play because you are a chess man everything moves yeah. what was the decision to join Islam? the closer you find yourself to God the closer you find yourself to Islam that's the bottom line of it if you're going to be atheistic like I was and then start to believe in God and then you're going to default to Christianity like I was because I was raised Christian and then now I live in Romania which is the second or third most Christian nation on earth I think it's 98% Christian in the last census and it's orthodox Orthodox, I respect much more than Catholic because the Pope is an agent of the matrix. And orthodoxy is still strong and strict and they still believe a lot of the rules and laws. But as you find yourself closer and closer to God, you find yourself closer to the idea of rigidness and the fact that there should be strict, clear boundaries and guidelines. God says yes and no. God doesn't say, well, maybe if you want to, it's okay on these days you shouldn't but no god says yes and no god is very clear and the closer you find yourself to god you start to want that as a christian i don't know how you answer to certain questions anymore yes as a true believer but which christians are true believers anymore 
As a Christian, I don't know what the correct answer is to a lot of the degeneracy that is happening in the world today. I don't know what a Christian would say. Would they say, it's fine, we forgive them for what they're chopping kids' dicks off? Or do they say that's wrong? What does a Christian say? I don't know. I know what a Muslim says. So it's like, it's the only religion left that makes sense to me. And uh, you say it's a brotherhood and it has your back. I didn't consider that before I joined. I've learned it's true after I joined. Yeah, it absolutely is. There's like every organization or every group of people on earth, it's, it can go both ways. There's certain people who attack me for not doing everything completely correct like I'm supposed to, even though I'm a Muslim for seven months. They're like, oh, you didn't read this bar. Or so you do have those people. But in general, yeah, it's a community. But I never considered that before I joined. I just found myself becoming more and more religious and finding myself speaking to God in my head more and more often and then being very disappointed with the Christianity I see around me. How can I speak to God in my head and look for his guidance and then walk past a church and just covered in gay pride flags. It doesn't make it make sense to me. I, I just, I just found myself alienated from Christianity. It's like, well, which religion sticks to what it means? Which religion says what it means and means what it says? Cause that's the kind of person I am. And I want a religion that reflects my personality. And I want to believe that God also thinks the same way. So you end up drawn to Islam. Who has God to you? Well, and I don't want to get in trouble with the Haram police. I do think there is one God. I'm not an Islamic scholar, so I have to be very careful what I say. But they, I think that in Islam, we have a lot of respect for Christians, and we say that on the Day of Judgment, they will see that they were almost right. They were just a few things wrong, and they're very close. But for a long time, I was an atheist, and I can't tell you exactly when I decided God was real, but one day I just absolutely knew he was. And I think the easiest way I can explain it in the way it works in my mind is that Newton's third law is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And if you look at the amount of evil that's happening in the world today, there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. And I'd like to think the force behind the good, which is combating the evil is God. That's the best way I can explain it. I think if you're doing good things in the name of God, then you make God real. If I feed 10,000 children in the name of God, God fed them because God made me want to do it. So God is real. I, no one can come along to me and say God isn't real. We can argue about if he's a man in the sky, if he's a concept, if he's an idea, where he lives, all these things. And once again, I make this very clear. I'm not an Islamic scholar. I'm not an actual scholar in any religion. I'm just talking about how I conceptualize and see God is that if the entire world was acting to God's will and it made the world a better place, then God made the world a better place. How much has having that belief on a higher power kept you sane in the dark times of your life at the now? Yeah, it's certainly a superpower. I, I, I don't see how it can detriment your mindset. It's kind of interesting because maybe this is one of the reasons I found myself religious. I haven't analyzed, I haven't self-analyzed my religious journey heavily enough to discuss it because it just happened which is why I believe it's so genuine. But I did say a few things a few years ago, and I said, I refuse to believe in things that take power away from me when I was describing the fact that I don't believe depression is real. So when I feel depressed, I accept that I just feel depressed. I don't believe I have depression because I don't believe depression is real. I feel depressed and one day I'll stop feeling depressed because I can't have depression because it's not real. A ghost can't haunt you if you don't believe in ghosts. It's just a noise, it gives a shit, it's the wind, whatever, going back to sleep. So by believing in it, you give it power. I refuse to believe in things that take power away from me. For the same reason, by extension, I guess you could also say I like to believe in things that give power to me. This is the first time I've ever had this thought. I've never pre-thought this. I'm saying it live in front of people, but perhaps one of the reasons I was so drawn to God is because I understood it gave me power. I understood I was a more powerful, formidable man. I was a more competent and dangerous and diligent opponent, a more feared opponent, if I believed I had God on my side. Why would I adopt a mindset that makes me less competitive? I mean, I have plenty of enemies. People are out to get me. We've proved that. Why would I adopt a mindset that allowed me to be less competitive in the heat of battle? If you're going to be, if you're going to go into a war, you want to be as competitive as possible physically and mentally. And you look at every war zone. You look at any war zone on earth. I guarantee the soldiers are religious. I bet they believe in God. If you got shot, you'd start praying. If you were on that submarine underneath the ocean, show me an atheist that wouldn't pray. Show me an atheist that wouldn't pray in that submarine. When shit gets hard, you need God. Why do you think it has, the shit has to ha ha hit the fan for people to believe in a higher power? Because look at life, look at the human body, the anatomy, <coughs> the central nervous system, the brain, something's created us. Yep. So why do you think that 
people have to wait because the law of attraction is a big thing and I've been listening to you. Do you think you could have actually spoke a lot of your misery into existence because you're saying what's going to happen? That's a good question. So the first thing, the reason I think people need God only when things hit the fan, it's the same thing we discussed earlier about people not being grateful for anything until they lose it. That's it's the same mindset. We go to God when we have problems, but when everything's going good, we don't thank him enough. And that's one thing I try and make sure I never do. I don't pray to God to ask for things. I pray to God to say, thank you for things I already have. That's the, one of the first mindset things I tried to change is to show gratefulness to him. By extension, I show gratefulness to my life. That's the first thing. And the second point, what was the second point you mentioned about, um, you mentioned speaking something, Sorry. speaking it into existence. Yep. As for speaking things into existence, I've actually thought about that. And a lot of people have said that to me, Andrew, stop putting it in the universe because you're saying they're going to do these things and then those things happen. But then I also feel like by saying them, I, I protect myself. Imagine I never told the world 25 times they're going to put me in jail for no reason. Like the second I went to jail for no reason, that helped me a lot. So I'm kind of predicting the future as a shield. I'm not trying to speak them into existence. I'm trying to predict the future as a shield, but I understand what you're saying. And I have to, it's a fine line. I have to be very careful because- What's so powerful? Oh, they're absolutely powerful. And I also don't want to speak, I also don't want to make anything come true, right? Because it's amazing how you can also self-fulfill things. You can make things come true by self-fulfilling them. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to say something, it's hard for me to think of an example off the top of my head, but if I say, uh, I believe they're going to break in my house and they're going to kill me or whatever. When I hear noises at night, I, it fucks my head up. Who knows what I'm going to do? I might badly react. I might, who knows? So I don't want to self-fulfill either, but I do have, when I have a strong suspicion and I feel that something's going to happen, I feel like I have to say it to try and protect myself. And yeah, words are absolutely and utterly powerful. Language is a, is a magic spell and you have to be very yeah. careful how you use it. You listen to Tupac. I was a big Tupac fan and he used to always speak what happened to him. Yeah. So you definitely need to be careful. It's, words are so powerful, just as much as thoughts. Yeah. You can speak your own life into existence. You've yeah. created this life by what you spoke, the 100%. confidence, the, yeah. I wouldn't say arrogance, but there's a fine line of both. Yeah. You've created this whole life, this whole journey. I believe you will come through it. I believe you will get stronger and I believe you will leave a positive message where people go, do you know what? This guy's actually okay. And again, this is why these interviews are so powerful because we have stripped back all the bullshit. Yep. This isn't a laugh and a joke anymore. This is serious stuff. Yep. My kid looks up to you. Yep. People, his teachers are telling him to delete photos of the me and you because it's bad for him. Yep. I've had phone calls from the school. Wow. They need to delete that photo. And I'm thinking, why? They've tried to take down a podcast. They've thrown them off of TikTok. I always stand my ground with what I believe in. I ain't fucking daft. I ain't a mind reader. I, I don't spend 24 seven with you, but I'm a good judge of character. I believe you will leave a great message people do look up to you all around the world how do you then change the narrative and and make people see that you are a decent fucking guy yeah what do you how do you change the, the moves and i think a lot of people have now it's just it's just the matrix itself which is left which is trying to push these narratives i'll give you an example bbc will talk about how i said something eight years ago on a video that got 100 views that could be misunderstood by young boys and is dangerous. I do not believe there is any 15 year old boy on the planet who is finding eight year old videos with a hundred views, watching them an hour long, taking out three seconds of it, putting it into his brain, ignoring the rest, and then becoming a bad person. The only reason these boys even hear these clips is because the BBC continue to use them in an attempt to slander me. So who's really poisoning their minds? It could be long gone, like it's old and it's out of context. The BBC are incessant on trying to prove I'm a bad person. So they're doing the exact thing they're accusing me of doing. It's only the matrix themselves that is left trying to say I'm a bad person. Most people at home understand it. The support I have is fantastic. 99% of people are on my side. People support me. And that's, that's huge for me to know in, inside of my heart. It makes me feel fantastic. But the best thing you can do is lead by example, right? And I guess that that's also another thing about this entire trial and this hero's journey I have to go through. I have to embrace it and face it with bravery and deal with it like a man should deal with it, regardless of the outcome. Just stand up and deal with it like a man and see how it goes, regardless of the outcome, and be the hero that I hope inspires men to be a hero also in their own life. I also, I kind of hope men look at me and go, if he's going through that crap, well, then maybe I can go through this. This is not as bad. If that's the example I have to set, if I have to charge and lead from the front and 
suffer to a degree to help people, then that's the path God chose for me. So we'll see how it goes. Why did you let the BBC invite in your house though? Yeah. So they, they do were, you, do you regret that? I don't regret it because I destroyed them so badly, but I, I wasn't, I was certainly suspicious of them and I knew they were going to try something, but they lied to me, but I didn't never, I would never say I trusted them, but they lied to me. They told me they were going to come and ask me questions about my mental health. And they sat me down and attacked me in an attempt to slander my name with a big setup. And they wanted to talk to me for two hours and find three minutes of me making a mistake or stuttering or not being able to answer a question and use it against me to slander my name like they've always been doing. But I made a complete fool of them. And that scares me also because that's their primary weapon is the media. And if you continue to destroy the media, they're going to find other weapons, which is scary to me. Now they've moved on to the judicial system. We'll see what happens after that. But I let them in, not because I trusted them, but I thought, you know what, after all these months in jail and the fact they're asking me questions about my mental health, and this is my first time them talking to the Matrix in a very long time, this might be an interesting conversation. And I was wrong. So instead, I had to teach them all a lesson. I made fools of them. I made fools of them. Like, I, I made absolute clowns of them. They should have just asked me interesting questions. They're yeah, just like we're talking about now. You don't have to challenge and, and be an ass to... Get what you want. Piers Morgan as well, your first interview, he seemed to have came for you, but that fucking tune sort of changed yeah. straight after. I think he realised this guy's actually okay. Yeah. How are you feeling with that first interview? Yeah, I mean, I didn't expect him to come that hard, and he did, but this is the thing. This is where I was saying earlier about I believe the spiritual consciousness of people is changing, and I think that we're in the middle of a great awakening because after the first Piers Morgan interview, when he came for me so, so, so hard, after the interview, I was like, well, this would be interesting to see back. And as I watched it back, it was hundreds of thousands of comments of people saying, Piers, what the fuck are you doing? Leave the guy alone. People are tired of the MSM in their lives. I believe people like you and your channel has more power than most MSM outlets. I, I would argue right now that the Daily Mail said the two plus two is five. And if you said two plus two is four, you'd, you'd have more impact than them. I think the MSM is genuinely failing in real time. I think that citizen journalism is the way to go. And I think that if the MSM want to even stay relevant, gatekeeping information and trying to set narratives and attack people that they're told to attack is just going to destroy them even quicker but they're not allowed to change because the only reason they exist in the first place is to do these things yeah but we're living in a society where people's feelings count more than actual truth well also yeah and and the bbc is the british broadcasting corporation they are they are a government funded agency and it is their goal to purport what the government wants purported upon the population if the government wants you to believe the sky is green the bbc are the people are going to tell you the sky is green that's their job. Do people, do you think the news exists to inform you? Do you think the news, which is free and everywhere, is made by nice people so you know what's going on? You, Mr. Nobody at home. They really want you to know what's happening. That's why they give you this nice news channel. You fucking dumb. <laughs> you hear your fucking mind? <laughs> they don't give a shit about you. You don't know anything about how the world works. The only things they show you are bullshit things you're not allowed to, that don't affect anything. They distract you with garbage constantly. And if they're going to tell you something as a fact, it's a lie. So anyone who believes any of this shit left, I, I mean, there are some people which are just beyond saving, pure matrix agents. But anyone who's believing anything the MSM says, I'm truly at the point now, if I watch the news and they say something, I, I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe a word. Like even the most basic things. Today, this happened there. Nah. I, I don't believe a word they say. All they do is lie. What do you think people need to realize to try and make a better life for themselves? Because obviously there's music as well. You've got 808s. You've got certain beats that can trigger the, the central nervous system. We've got news channels. We've got TikTok. The attention span of the human being is coming down. Yeah. What do you think people need to do to wake up and try and see the world a bit differently to live a better life? I think a lot of it comes down to the community and the people you're talking to and the people you are associating with. I think if you're around free minds, your mind's going to be free. I think that the number one force of gravity on humanity is always going to be your social circle and peer pressure, whether it's positive or negative. You could talk about this. You said you struggle with addiction. If you hang around, what do they say once you, they say you quit drugs, they say get new friends, right? I'm guessing, but yeah. I've heard they say that. They say, if you're going to go back and hang around with the same people, you're going to end up doing the same shit. So I think that the number one gravity you can have on your life in any direction is the people you hang around with. And everyone understands this. They say that you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Everybody knows that, but then they don't create their circle. If you hang around with people who are free thinking and perspicacious and use their minds and look around them, look around and come to their own conclusions and they're doing well and they're working hard and they're dedicated and they're rich, you're not going to be the only idiot. You're going to end up adopting some of their qualities and they're not going to talk to you anymore, right? So you're going to have to. So I think the most important thing you can do is just make sure you have a social circle of people around you you trust. 
And I get more information from my social circle than I will do from any news network. Let's say COVID two comes back. I'll text all my friends. Is this bollocks? You could, you good, you good, you good. Everyone? Yeah, bollocks. All right, bollocks. <laughs> all right, done then. But it's scary how humans can be so dumbed down that they're actually in a lockdown. They never left their house. They're banging pots and pans at eight o'clock at night, basically celebrating Bruv. being in lockdown. And, and now it's all coming out. You see Joe Rogan speaking about it and fair play to the man. Why were you never on Joe Rogan? Why did that connection never happen yet? Yeah, I haven't been to the USA yet. That's why. Um, hopefully with timing in the future, perhaps I'll go when I, when I visit America. I'll That's go. the ultimate. It would be good. Yeah. And there's a lot we can certainly talk about. And it's, you're right about banging the pots and pans. And, but even then COVID, the reason I ignored it is because of my social circle, my brother, my cousin and me, we sat around this exact table, this table. And we said, if COVID is going to kill us, military age males in prime physical condition, then the world is over. So what are we hiding for? The world is literally about to collapse. It's done. Where's open? Sweden. Cool. And we flew to Sweden and partied the whole time while people banged pots and pans like dummies. And we were in full nightclubs and full hotels. And it was, Sweden never closed. And nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about the fact that Sweden was open the entire time. I think Sweden's got the less COVID, less COVID deaths than anywhere in the world. It was open the whole time. And when I say open, they mean, what do you mean open? Like social distancing? No. Open. And Stockholm was crazy. Everyone was out partying and it was just nuts. I couldn't believe it. We were crazy times. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah, bro. And, and the fact that nobody mentions that anymore. No one mentions COVID anymore. You want to talk about slave minds. No one talks about it. They psyoped you into staying in your house and destroying your business. And they, for three years of your life, your kids didn't go to school and they put you in debt and they locked you in your house. And yeah, yeah. On, on Ukraine. Like they don't even talk about it anymore. Now they're talking about Ukraine. It's, it's crazy. People are just, they say sheeple. And I guess to a degree they are. What more can you say? What do you think the state of the world does just now? I think we're in the middle of a spiritual awakening and I think the awakening will push towards truth. And I think that truth is always a good thing. However, when the truth is shown, especially regarding a lot of the systems we have currently organizing and controlling the world, the systems will no longer be trusted and they'll break down. And there's going to be a degree of chaos. There's going to be a transitionary period because once people truly understand how the judicial system works and the media system works and the financial system works and the political system works, if people knew these things, it would be over. So they'd all have to change. I think they're all going to have to change what they'll change into. Hopefully they'll be more based on truth and transparency. And I believe that'll be a good thing overall. I think that if we have a world, which is truth based, we're going to do well. So I do think perhaps we have some hard times ahead, but I'd like to believe that in the end, the world will be good, but we're going to have to see. It amazes me that people listen to me and they understand that I am telling the truth and they understand that I have information which can benefit them and can change their life, yet they do not join my completely free emailing list at CobraTape.com. If Andrew Tate's president, what changes does it make to make the world a better place? Yeah, if Andrew Tate's president... The first answer to that is it depends if the president has any power, because I'd also argue the point that presidents don't have any power anymore. They can't do much. But secondly, to quote Whitney Houston, children are our future. So I think if you start with the education system and the things you're teaching people, as you said yourself earlier, that you can change the world pretty quickly. And I think a lot of very important people understand that, which is why it's so scary they're teaching the things they're teaching, because it's not an accident. They're trying to push the world in a very particular direction. If they want to push the world, if you're in charge of the world, you think generationally, your children will be in charge of the world when you're gone. And if you want a certain planet, if you want the planet to operate in a certain way, yeah, you put things on the news for the adults, but what you truthfully do is you tell the children things because they're gonna grow into the people who eventually you'll be in charge of. And when you look at school curriculum, looking at it and going, this is all pointless, why are they teaching this? This is dumb, is actually very optimistic. When you look at it and you see the things they're actually teaching and you see all the pointlessness and a lot of the destructive attitudes and mindsets they're teaching to children and understand that it's purposeful, it's far scarier. The educational system is the primary tool of brainwashing and propaganda on the planet. What about, was there any big names that came forward and showed support? Like Elon Musk and Joe Rogan's, who you're quite surprised with, Jordan Peterson? Yeah, Patrick Bet David was, I have to give him credit. That's why I gave him the first interview. He, he stuck up for me massively when I was in jail. Um, and I, I do believe there were some others, but I'm in jail. So I, I, it was hard for me to see. Now I'm out, I get a lot of support, but I also know a lot of the people who are supporting me now said nothing when I was in jail. It's life, right? Bandwagon, 
jump on the tape bandwagon now. So I don't know. I, I didn't really track it. I do remember that Patrick Red David really stuck up for me. He was a good guy. Uh, Elon reinstated my Twitter and he let me keep my Twitter the whole way through, which is I have to give him credit for because they deleted Meta deleted my brother. I was already canceled. My brother wasn't, but they deleted my brother's Instagram when he went to jail. So he allowed me to keep my Twitter to defend myself. So I have to give him massive credit for that. But um, I think I believe I, I believe I had a lot of silent support. Like, I don't want to say names because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But even this morning, I got a message from somebody who was at somebody's house in L.A. And him plus another guy are massive fans. And like, these are the most famous people in the world. So it is kind of crazy. It's kind of nuts. Uh, but people should own it. As a man, if you believe in something, just own it. I agree. Don't stop being a pussy, man. Just own it. I agree. If you put yourself at the forefront, then you've got, re you've got respect. Yeah. Because you don't become a man if you're too scared to say something in case you lose something because it's irrelevant. You can always build it back. Yep. I always say this, people get cancelled, but I always believe they can cancel themselves because there's always something you can do to then come back. Yep. Always. Yep. It's a defeated attitude. They've cancelled me, so I'll just quit. It's not the case. Tommy Robinson speaks very highly of you. Yep. Another man. What, is it? what the fuck's in the water in Luton? <laughs> but two men. Tommy Robinson's one of the most famous <laughs> men in the UK. No, he came to the forefront. His mind has changed. Yep. I didn't agree with a lot of his views. Me and him are back and forth back in the day. Yep. Now he's became a good friend because he's understanding life. I don't know if, like you say, with all the shit you go through, I wouldn't say it humbles you, but it makes you question the world that, okay, I've got a platform I need to actually, I can do better. Yeah. What's the connection? How did you and Tommy Robinson come about? Yeah, we're both from Luton, so we both know each other and we've always kind of known each other. And I've always understood his patriotism and his desire to have the UK a Christian country and with full of English people. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's ever bad to be patriotic about the place you're born from. But um, obviously I completely disagree with him on Islam now. At the time, I kind of, I'm not gonna say I agreed with him, but I understood his points. But uh, I really look forward to having a conversation with Tommy. That'll be a really interesting podcast because I think he, He has a lot to learn still, I believe. Let me say this in a very diplomatic way. He talks about, you know, the indoctrination of children and how the country's failing and all these things. And he, he, he's trying to find the opposite force to contest these things. And the opposite force to evil is always going to be good, which is God. And I'd like to think he believes in God, but I guess he's a Christian, which is fine. But if the Christian church has no teeth, if the Christian God isn't feared, how can it be God? How can you have a God you can mock? How can you mock God and nothing happen? How is that God? Is that the God you believe in? It's not the God I believe in. So I think he's going to have to accept that there's a logic fail somewhere in his thinking. If he wants an, a good force to oppose evil and he accepts that that must be God, then the God must be powerful. It can't be a weak God. So how can you say it's not Islam? But we'll see. We'll talk to him about it. It'll be yeah. interesting. It'll be an interesting conversation. And I'm not here to convert anybody either. That's not my intention. But yeah, Tommy's saying a lot of the problems with England is Islam. And maybe for a time, I would maybe thought he had a point when it came to patriotism and that kind of thing. But I, I must disagree with him because it's the Muslims who are protesting against the indoctrination of children. It is the Christians that put him in jail. Muslims didn't put him in jail. Christians put him in jail. Yeah, I look forward to talking to Tommy. I don't want to give away all my talking points now, but uh, it was the white Christian judge that put him in jail. And I do believe that you can't save people who don't want to be saved and you can't make people think a certain way who don't want to be open-minded or understand your points. And I also believe that the strong conquer the weak. I think that's a universal law. Even if you look up in the space, right? Large planets attract smaller planets and destroy them. That's how it works. I think if you're going to have a weak culture or a weak mindset or even a weak religion eventually it will perish and that only the strong survive and no matter how hard one individual champions a particularly weak ideology it doesn't make a difference if yeah. the ideology itself is not strong i don't see how england can call itself a christian nation anymore i don't think it's a christian country i can walk through london and mock jesus i cannot walk through london and mock allah so how is it a christian country if i can mock the god of the nation and nothing happened to me. The only religion people are afraid to mock in that Christian country is Islam. Yeah, if it, it's like any religion, there's always good and bad. It's like anything in life, there's good and bad. For of me course. personally, it's just if you're a good person, you can be. I'm probably close to Muslim than anything. I don't drink, don't eat bacon, don't smoke, don't yeah. take drugs, don't gamble. Yeah. 
But for me, I just, I believe I'm on God. I believe I can create whatever. Listen, things might change in a year, five years, 10 years, yep. and that's okay. I was raised a Catholic. I've got a crucifix fucking tattooed on my back that I detest now. <laughs> I've got some random man fucking the size of my back tattooed. So who the fuck is it? It's a guy with long hair who I've never met, yeah, but yeah. I bought into it. Yeah. And at that time, it probably served me. But for me, I'm open-minded. If you're Muslim and you're doing well, do you know what? I've got nothing but respect. If you're Christian, you're doing yeah. well. I've had homeless people who turn to Christ and end up changing their life, coming off addiction and end up wanting to help other people. Yeah. I've got many Muslim brothers and sisters who are fucking solid and they do amazing things for charity and their mums and dads are amazing. Every time I get into their house, there's always amazing food, nothing but love and respect. So yeah. if you're good, you're good. A lot of people can do bad things and then blame religion. But you're going to get that if there's over 2 billion people in each religion, there's going to be mad People bastards. do good and bad things in the name of everything. Yeah. Veganism, science, safety. Safety's the biggest thing. The idea of safety is is the, where they do the, the most heinous acts. Since the beginning of time, it's always been safety. For your safety, bang the pots and pans, lock in your house. Miss your doctor's appointment, die of something real because of COVID. So even in the name of safety, which we can all agree is a fantastic thing, bad things can be done in his name. Everything could be Trojan horsed. But um, yeah, I look forward to talking to Tommy. It'd be very interesting. And I don't know Tommy's views on God and I don't know how he's changed of recent. I haven't seen him in a very long time, but it'd be very interesting to talk to him. And you never changed. know, I might convert yeah. him. <laughs> I, I, maybe that's what's missing in his life. <laughs> All that hate and rage. You'll see him in Saudi yeah. with a big it, beard. It has, it has changed. You'd be surprised at the things he's talking about. He's talking about the royal family. He's talking about wars. He's talking about, because he was very patriotic. He was yeah. in the EDL. Yeah. But now he's talking about, he's waking up to realizing yeah something ain't right here kate hopkins i think it's only people who get cancelled to just show so much support for you because they understand that mm -hmm. when they come for you i never thought i'd be friends with kate hopkins and tommy robinson very close to understand life i don't agree with views that they do and certain that but they don't agree with everything i do and that's okay alex jones man who's a massive supporter of you yeah. all these people who were cancelled why do you think it's them who do you think it's because they understand the shit that you go through i think it's they understand the shit you go through and they also even if they don't agree with every word you say they respect you for having an opinion and telling the truth mm -hmm. the scariest thing about the world we live in today is that there are people out there who do not think other people should have opinions my opinion is x his opinion is y they should get rid of him because of his opinion that's the most truly scary thing i have no problem debating or arguing with anybody about any opinion and I believe you're entitled to have it. And I think you should be able to say it. I don't care if you, even if your opinion is I'm a dickhead, keep it, fine, say it, no problem. If your idea is so fantastic, then come and challenge me with it and defend it. That's what I think the, I think the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. I'm not saying I'm right about everything. If I believe this and you believe this, the truth might be here. That's the whole point of our debate, of our argument, of our disagreement. But there are people out there who genuinely believe nobody should have an opinion that differs to them. And those people, by coincidence, always have the exact same opinion that the matrix wants them to have. Isn't that interesting? These people never think, I don't want anyone to have a different opinion and my opinion's completely unique. No, I don't want anyone else to have a different opinion and my opinion's what the TV tells me to have. Those are the most dangerous people. The most dangerous people on the planet are the complicit people. Compliance, it's complicity that's dangerous. It's the complicity that allowed all the Jews to be murdered. They just comply. Oh, well, you know, it's not me and it's not my problem. And the TV said, the radio told me. So much has been done in the name of compliance. All of this COVID garbage was just a big compliance test. Compliance. We know this because in the countries where nobody listened, COVID ended pretty quickly. The countries that didn't comply, there was no COVID. In the countries that complied, there was COVID. That's how the disease worked. It's clown world. It's, it's, it's absolute insanity. So compliance is a very dangerous and very scary thing. But some people's minds are not ready to be freed. They say it inside of the matrix. This is the reason I call it the matrix because that movie so accurately describes the world we live in in so many different ways. But it says so many, so many, so many people's minds are not ready to be freed and there's nothing you can say to them. They're just going to become an agent when you attempt to free them. If you sit down and make it clear that you're a free mind, they're going to morph into an agent and try and kill you. They're just going to sit there and say, no, COVID. And they're going to defend it. The producers of the matrix are now transgender. I know, which is also another mind fuck. It's, <laughs> it's all weird. Like, I don't know. But that is a very interesting, yeah, that's that's a super interesting point because the movie's so based and then who knows? I but the think... women who actually wrote that, wrote The Terminator as well, The Matrix is a follow-up from The Terminator. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. There you go. Oh, thank yeah. you. Interesting. So The Terminator was the first film, The Matrix was after that, so it's all connected. She actually sued them for a billion or something. Wow. American women, because it's not their movie. She wrote The Terminator and The Matrix to follow up. Wow. 
So it was all about the robots and how it ends all connected. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, I'll have to look that up and then. Yeah, and and I'm saying something. your name. Crazy. Fucking crazy. Because how could they make basically a documentary about questioning life, but then they go trans? I have no problem with anybody going yeah. trans. Just don't fucking teach my kids that. Yeah, and that's that's the scariest thing, right? Because we just, as we said earlier, the education system is how you morph a country. It's how you affect the country on the long on the long term. And the things they're teaching children, they're not teaching under the guise of tolerance or we want the children to understand. No, they're trying to change the population for the future in a specific direction. Are they trying to make the population of young men, let's talk about men specifically, heroic and hardworking and strong and protective and have strong principles and boundaries? No. What are they trying to do them instead? Teach them to be tolerant and pacifist and flaccid and compliant and complicit in a bunch of garbage. And why are they trying to do that? Well, if you're going to try and raise a nation of slaves, do you want slaves that resist or slaves that comply? Which, which would you want? We'd want compliant slaves, of course. So if you sit and say, by the year 2100, we're going to control the money with CBDCs, and we're going to control where they go with their electric cars, and we're going to control what they're allowed to see and say, otherwise they're going to go to jail. We want to make sure we have compliant people inside of this nation, compliant slaves. We don't want people who stand up and resist this. No. So that's why me coming along with my massive influence, even doing something as simple as advocating for men to go to the gym, being strong of, my, of body and mind now is an act of resistance. Just training hard and saying no to ideas you don't agree with makes you a rebel. And if you have enough people who listen to you, like I have, they will punish you for that. Yeah, it's crazy. You can down the rabbit hole, we talk about chemtrails, but I think one of the Kennedys was talking to Joe Rogan, Alex Jones says that, he says they're putting stuff in the water to make people turn gay. They've yeah. done a trial with frogs with the same water, and after 10 weeks they were all gay. Yeah. Who knows? And you've got to question everything, You're but again, be. I don't know. I just like the thought of conspiracies as well. Unless I see it with my own eyes, whether the moon landings are fake, the world round or flat, I genuinely don't know. How can I tell somebody yeah. about it if I've never seen it? Completely. Are, are we avatars? Are we aliens? Are we computers? Are we in a fucking game, a simulator, total recall? Yeah. Uh, what was the Jim Carrey for them? Uh, Truman Show. The Truman Show. Yeah. But what are we? Yeah. Because I've, I've, I've been around people who died, took their last breath, my father, my great uncles. I've been around them when they took their last breath. And when they take their last breath, it's a sigh of relief. They're not screaming. They're not shouting. They're going in peace. Yeah, yeah. So it tells me that something else is out there. For sure. That's really interesting. I never heard that before, but I can imagine it to be true. And yeah, by the time we'll learn about what all this is about, it'll be too hindsight, right? It'll be too, it'll be, uh, uh -huh. too late to affect any of it. But uh, that's why you have to build your mental models in your brain and decide what you're going to live by and what you're going to try and do with your life and how you're going to operate. And I truly, genuinely like the idea of everybody who interacting with me having a better day because of it. I think if you're just a good person and you do good things and you tell the truth, I think overall, you're not going to regret that decision very often. I can't think of many times I look back on a situation in my life and I think, ah, I wish I was less polite. I wish I was, I wish I was a worse person. I wish I, I wish I cheated and lied. Maybe you get them now and again, but I, that doesn't really happen to me. Perhaps you think, you know what? I should have just told the truth. Should have come clean. Shouldn't have done that. I what? wish I was more honest. Why do you think so many people gravitate towards you, Andrew? I think people gravitate towards me because I tell the truth in a convincing way, in an engaging way, but also I've shown that the, the path of truth and the path of being a good person can actually lead to a lifestyle that I know many people want. I think that it's a, it's a huge tapestry that my brand has and the financial success is part of it for sure. But I also think it's the fact that I don't cower. I don't bend or say sorry. I don't apologize. And I think that, that that attracts a degree of respect in any red-blooded man on the planet. The fact that I will stand up and say, no, this is what I said. This is what I meant. We'll put you in jail. Then put me in jail. Yeah. And I think that that is quite unusual in the world today where someone does something, True Jordy gets canceled, issues an apology. Duh, like, it's just, it's all so, so gay. I'm like, no, I, that's what I said. At, I'm not saying I still mean it. At the time, I said what I meant. I'm not saying I haven't changed. I'm not saying I haven't grown. I'm not saying I shouldn't have said it. I'm saying that I say what I mean. I mean what I say, and that's what it is. And uh, that's part of it. And I also feel like I've been put in a position where my struggle is not just for me anymore. I think I'm fighting for a lot more than just me. Do you feel that pressure? I do feel the massive pressure because I feel like me winning 
can genuinely change the world for better in so many ways. You do know if you ever got convicted that so many people would be heartbroken. I don't think anybody would. I still don't think anyone would believe. Yeah, but you know, people who genuinely love you yeah. would go, mm, they would question it and then it would, like, because you're the pressure, that's the whole world's watching your fucking life. Yeah. Truman Show. Yeah. Watching your life, that pressure is immense. I got a few million watching this a month and I feel pressure constantly, keep trying to improve and yeah. achieve. And if I get less of views that month, I feel as if I'm not good enough. Yeah, Imposter yeah. syndrome kicks in, insecurities yeah. kick in, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. Yeah. And then I'll try and work hard and then I get myself all stressed. I'll not sleep for fucking 24 hours. And I yeah. just, I don't know if that's to be liked. I don't know if it's, it's, it's a whole host of things. I'm not stupid. I do struggle, but I, I kick on. I don't. Yeah defeat i think about drinking and taking drugs and going back to more ways because it's fucking easier yeah. it's easier being a loser oh 100 percent is easier it takes bravery to do the right thing yeah it always takes bravery to do the right thing and it takes bravery to do anything of, of merit it takes bravery to love somebody it's very easy to just run around and fuck girls and not love any of them that doesn't make you a hero you're a hero if you love someone who you know can break your heart who might leave that's bravery it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very it's it's hard to do the right thing all the time it's hard to be with somebody, and I'm talking about relationships now because it's just an easy way to apply it. It's hard to be with somebody and sit down and both of you admit you both did wrong and you want to make it work. That's hard. Most people take the opposite. What's the opposite route? Ego? No, I'm perfect and I don't do anything wrong and you do everything wrong. But then what does it lead to in the end? I believe in the end it will lead to misery. I think that's where a lot of people end up. They, they leave the relationship they have. They think the grass is greener. They get over there, realize it isn't. Try and come back left, right, left, right, boom, misery. Right? What do you think created does? What is a human? What do you think in your own perspective? Well, I think God has created us. And I think that he has created us in his image. And I believe that life, the purpose of it is to learn. And it is to struggle and it is to suffer. And I don't think that we are put on the planet to be happy. I actually genuinely believe we are put on the planet to learn things and to struggle and to genuinely suffer. I think that life is suffering. And I'm not saying this in a negative way. I think that if you want to be any kind of man of caliber, your life needs to be full of suffering. If you don't have that story of pain, you don't have a story at all. It's just the way the world works. You're not going to be a credible man who is respected if you don't have a bunch of pain and problems in your past. If you wake up and you're born as a man and everything goes exactly to the way you want it to and everything's nice and easy, nobody's going to respect you. And you're not even going to be happy yourself. I believe that also the masculine imperative not only is to give, like we said earlier, but it is to overcome struggle. We look at struggles and we look at problems and we want to overcome them. You just said it yourself. I want more followers. I want to get bigger. It's a problem. I want to fix it. I've got to beat it. It's inside of us. So I think that all these bad things that happen to us are actually a blessing. We should be glad for all of them. We should be proud for them. I'm glad God put me in jail. That's the mental model I've decided because I refuse to believe in anything that takes power away from me. And I believe that I'll be the most powerful person, version of myself if I am happy that I went to jail. And if by some miracle I lose this case and they put me in jail again, the mental model I will adopt is good. Okay. God has something he needs me to learn. So I'm going to go back to the dungeon. And that's just the mental model I'm going to adapt because I think that's the best way for me to compete and be the best version of myself. So a human, I think, is a vessel designed to suffer to become a best version of itself so it can pass on lessons to the fullest of its capability to its offspring before its ultimate demise onto the final stage or the, the next stage of this life or whatever lives we live. So we'll see. Why do you think so many relationships are breaking down now? So many divorces. I know the stats have come through that women in their thirties, the thing is like fifty percent are not having kids anymore, yeah. and the it's, stats are between their seventy. It's they're going to be their biggest regret. Like, why do you think it's all it's social kind of media? It's outside influences. Do you think it's so? social media? It's outside influences, and not just outside influences from social media. It can be the girl's friends. If I have a girlfriend, I say you do not insult me to your friends ever because you think it's just venting, but overall, it's going to bite us. Because you're going to name every time we argue. You're never going to name the times we don't argue. Eventually, they're going to start saying I'm a piece of shit, and eventually, you're going to listen to them. Just don't say bad things about me to anybody. What's the point? It's like, if you want therapy, talk to me. A lot of it comes down to basic communication and ego. Like I said earlier, it takes bravery to sit down and say, look, I think you're completely wrong. I think I'm completely right, but I'm not going to attack you. I'm not going to be egotistical about this. Let's discuss this. Let me try and understand your point of view and let's fix it. And it's much easier just to be egotistical about things. It's ego that destroys relationships. And I don't believe in the long run that that's the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. And I also know that the grass is always greener where you water it. It's not the greener anywhere else. The amount of, most women or men 
they won't make any effort for their partner, but if they break up, then they'll fucking get in shape and, and, and put on the cologne and look their best to go try and get a new one. Should have done it for her. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? The grass is always greener where you water it. And I try and keep that in mind as well. And I don't really have a problem with relationships or anything, but I, I feel like I'm in a unique position because I have a really big battle on my hands and any woman who's with me understands that the fight I have is so large that her job is cheerleader and she does her very best and we get along quite well. But I'm not the person people think I am. They think, oh, top G, da, da, da. If a woman has a problem and she comes to me and she comes to me respectfully, I'll absolutely listen to her and try and help her. Of course I would. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. In the Patrick Bet David interview, you spoke about your testosterone, which yeah. is massive for men. Testosterone has dropped for men. Men are becoming weaker, softer. Yeah. We understand that. Why is your test so high? Because I think your body and your mind are linked. And my mind's constantly at war. I'm constantly stressed and people are trying to hurt me. And I think that if you are waking up every day and checking your phone to see which government agencies want you gone and which problems you have and which enemies of yours are gaining ground and you have to find a way to combat against all of this, when you have the British Broadcasting Corporation trying to spread lies about you and you have to get more views than they do, than the BBC, your mind's at constant war. I think your body reacts to that. I think... If you're constantly up for, if you constantly feel like you're in a fight, then your body's going to react. Why would your body not give your mind what it believes you need? If you live a soft life or an easier life, it'll probably go down. But if you live a hard life, it'll probably shoot up. And I guess it's just a reflection of the lifestyle I live and the way my mind is operating and the pressure I'm under and the stress I'm under. And that's also the reason it's dropping overall as a whole. It's not just because lives are getting easier. It's also because of the mental models they're instilling inside of men and children, like we're saying, we're not teaching them to fight back against their enemies, which would lead to an increase in testosterone. We're teaching them to just collapse and comply and be complicit with their enemies, which does the absolute opposite. Mm -hmm. it, it reduces it. So a lot of it, I believe, is mindset. I believe it's just mindset. My, my mind is at war, so my body is ready for war. Rumble, that stood behind you, it's had your back. You yeah. just done a live there, over half a million unbelievable numbers. Yeah. How big have they been? in your life the Rumble, last few months i have to give credit to rumble i really do believe that they're one of the last bastions of free speech on the planet uh when they supported me twitter didn't even exist or twitter was still fully left psycho i was deleted from there and rumble came along and i know the ceo very well and he's truly committed to free speech truly so anybody who has a youtube channel i strongly suggest you make a backup on rumble you can do it automatically you can make an account and click a few buttons and it'll upload all your videos automatically do everything and if you upload to youtube it'll automatically upload to rumble in in future so rumble is certainly one of the weapons that's being used to crack the matrix because the matrix is a information wall and if we can get through that and people can start to see the truth about things the world's going to change rumble's a fantastic site and yeah they've been huge for me and i'm never leaving where does andrew take go for the future i'm going to beat this case and then I do have plans for once the case is beaten, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Good man. Sometimes you can speak out of existence just as much as you can speak it into existence. Absolutely. For anybody that's watching that maybe believes the accusations and the charges, what would you say to them? I would say to them to use their minds and use their brains and don't judge me based on my personality or whether you like me or not, or don't be emotional about this. Let's be very logical. If you're a person who is watching this and you have a brain and you're smart, but you believe I'm a human trafficker, this is the story you must believe. You must believe that me, Andrew Tate, a man with no criminal record who has never been convicted of any crime in any country ever, at the age of 35, when he already had a net worth in excess of $250 million, decided to, start organ to form an organized criminal group and begin human trafficking. It's clearly not my personality profile because I don't have a criminal record. And it's clearly not a financial motivation because I'm already rich. He decided to human traffic his friends near him who had TikTok accounts who are now defending me saying, he didn't human traffic me, this is stupid, let him go. If you believe that story, that without financial motivation and without any other motivation, and the fact that I've never been a criminal before, I decided to somehow human traffic people close to me who are now defending me desperately saying this is unfair and corrupt and he should be let go. If you still believe that I'm a human trafficker, you should put a mask on and take your eighth booster injection because you're beyond help. For any kids that's watching who look up to you who's been told not to follow you anymore, what would you say to them? I would say to them that, and you know what's funny? Because I actually like the idea of children listening to their parents, even if it's not to follow me. Even though I know that's wrong, I don't want to teach children to rebel against their parents. Does that make sense? Of course. So it's quite a difficult one, but I think 
it's kind of funny. When you tell a young boy not to watch something, what does he do? Watch his up. Of course. So uh, I won't say much besides the fact that I will say one thing to my fans, and this is really true. Whenever you're defending me, I really want to make it clear. When you're defending me, to try and do it in a respectful way. Because sometimes haters come at me and talk a bunch of garbage. I don't want any of my fans to come along and say, well, you're an idiot, you're ugly, you're this, this, this. And, you know, I'll say it. I'm allowed. I'm a top G. Most of the girls who hate me are ugly. The hot ones always love me. But I would like the idea of being more respectful in the discourse. That's one thing I will say to any young boys who want to stick up for me. If you want to stick up for me, do it in a respectful way. For anybody that's watching in the struggle, who's going through it, maybe in prison, can't see a way out what advice would you have for them my advice is that one day you're going to look back on all the things you're currently going through and you're going to be glad they happened if you have the right mental model if you change how you think one day you will look back and be glad they happened and the most fantastic thing about changing the way you think is regardless of what people say to you or despite the fact they tell you it's not true i promise you one of the only things on the planet you can control is what you think can't control the weather can't control other people can't control if your heart stops you can't even keep it being but you can control what you think. I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. And if you change the way you view things, you change the perspective, you'll be happy that it's happened to you. Sometimes you can have an event or a, it's like a prism. You can have something and it's all about the perspective you view it from. And I think if you are malleable enough in your mind and disciplined enough to instill the correct software at the correct time to make sure that you're as competitive as possible, you can take any situation or scenario that you're going through and find the positive in it and make, use it to make you a better person. What do you think, just looking back in your life, you're still young, you still got your whole life ahead of you. How do you feel about it, just talking about it? And today, listen, today's a powerful conversation. It's natural, it's free-flowing, and this is Andrew Tate that I know. Yeah. So proud of you for to keep you. going, not quitting, because pressure gets to you, no matter if you're a top G. I've seen top Gs fucking yeah. not want to live here anymore. And yep. You've, you've, you've felt it yourself. It's a test of character, yep. everything you're going through. But what do you think, just kind of, finishing up at all and looking back at the last 36 years coming from your dad chess and getting moved around and try to do something from your life kickbox her listen you were on your ass for many years yep. kind of put yourself out and now you're a multi-mo you know you're hanging around with the right people you're doing an interview with me life's going great but what do you think just the life you've lived through it all yeah it's certainly been interesting there's been a lot of ups and a lot of downs and i've gone like you said from the absolute bottom to perhaps the top of the top and i think you learn a lot of lessons on the way and you need the juxtaposition to even enjoy anything at the top anyway. So I'm so glad for the bad times. There's nothing fun about being rich besides talking about when you were poor. The only point in buying a $10,000 stake is so you can sit with your brother and go, this is not worth 10 grand. I can't believe we spent 10 grand on this. We never had 10 grand in our savings account ever. And then we can both laugh about how poor we were. Otherwise, why be rich? If you were born rich, I think being born rich would be one of the worst experiences. I think one of the worst lives. How so? Because you, you have nothing, you're never going to truly ever appreciate or respect money. Money's never going to make you happy. You're never going to have those stories to compare anything to. You're just going to expect to, for everything to be done for you. And if heaven forbid something goes wrong and then you end up poor, you won't be able to deal with it. Imagine being rich till you're like born rich and you're rich your whole life. I'm talking about you've been on private jets as a kid, your parents had money and like, and then at, at 42, it all goes wrong and now you're a brokey. How would you even handle that mental shift of I can't pay the council tax? Imagine it. Like, I, I don't think you could be prepared to ever go broke. I don't think you'd appreciate anything. If you look at all these rich kids who go to these rich schools or these politicians kids or whatever they're all drug addicts they're all weirdos it's just i don't think it's a healthy mind model to be born and just be spoiled what do they say in the matrix they say the reason we have recreated the world at the end of 1999 the first matrix was a utopia and the human mind rejected it when we made everything perfect you didn't want it the human mind rejected it and you wouldn't listen we had to give you all this struggle and all these problems for you to accept the programming I think it's the same. If you were born rich, I think it'd be an awful existence. I don't think you'd ever, what are you struggling for? What are you working for? What are you striving for? For what? You know, and I think a man is different when he gets to that position where he has no safety net and he has to pull it off. You've been there. I've been there. I have to do, I have to pay the rent. Oh, just, no, I have to pay the rent. Let me borrow from dad. I have to pay the rent. Let me borrow from dad. No, like I have to, tomorrow I need two grand. Today I have fucking zero. There's nobody I can borrow from. And that's a small example. There's been much bigger examples. I don't want to send a podcast. You're a different kind of man when you've had to pull it off and you've suffered the consequences of failure or you find a way to pull it off. It's not the same if you just call daddy, is it? Last question. What's the biggest life lesson you've learned? You're 36 years on this planet. 
It's a really good question. Biggest life lesson. Good or bad? Yeah. I'm not sure because it's such a interwoven tapestry. It's a web, right? It's hard to say. However, I'll quote my father. That's what I'll do. My father said, I allow manipulation to find out where my enemy wants me to go. And then I use my mind to break the trap and punish the perpetrators. And I think that that is one of the biggest life lessons I would like to also teach to people around me. When someone is trying to teach you something or trying to tell you something, you need to first identify why they want you to believe it. Secondly, you need to identify how you're going to act once you believe it. Then you need to work out and decide, does this person have your best interests at heart? And if you go through those three things in order, you'll be surprised how many ideas you're told that you don't want to believe anymore. How much do you measure that? With all my heart, I always am. I'm always going to miss him. And uh, I idolized him, and I think a son should. But I also think it's the natural progression of life. The only alternative is I died before him which I think would be worse. I think it's worse for a parent to lose a child than a child to lose a parent. This is the way it's supposed to go. It's the natural order. So all I can be do, all I can do is be glad that it went in the natural order. And uh, it's a part of life that's unfortunate, but it's real. And they say you only become a man once you lose your father. So it's part of growing up, I guess. Yeah, I believe so. And that's the tough thing about life. Sometimes you've got to reach the depths of hell to understand there's more to it. Would they want us to suffer? Would they want us in pain? There's many times I used to sit full of fucking cocaine and I used to hear my dad, fucking listen. I used to go, what the fuck? That's good stuff, that. <laughs> <laughs> but I just hope somewhere, everything I do is in honour of his name and, I just, and I'm always posting about him. Sometimes it can be a bit, just a bit de fucking depressing, but I just want him to know if he can hear me, if he can see me. Yeah. Somebody's guiding me. I feel protected and everything I do is to go... I knew you could do it, son. And that's that's why you had sons, especially in the olden days. Maybe not so much anymore, but the, in the days of old, the reason you had sons was Andrew, son of Emery. You were the you were the continuation of your family name. That was the whole point of it. The reason I am here is to continue my father's name, and the reason you're here is to do the exact same thing. And we're doing that. We're here at this table. Millions of people are going to watch this. We're honoring our fathers. There's nothing more they could expect of us. We're doing exactly as a son should do, and I hope my son does the same thing. Andrew, would you like to finish up on anything? Um. I just want to say a massive thank you to all the world who is supporting me. The support does mean a lot. It is refreshing to understand that nobody believes this garbage. I'd like to ask people to go to my website uh, and sign up for my free newsletter because I give a lot of information out about my upcoming case and what's happening. You can go to cobratate.com and sign up for the newsletter. It's completely free. And besides that, this is going to be a long, arduous battle. So we, it's going to be a battle of attrition. And they're going to try their very best to damage me and all the messages of support are super appreciated. I think you've come over the worst though, but listen, Thanks, let me in your house and give me your time. Thank you. Nothing but respect. I genuinely wish you all the best for the future and I actually look forward to seeing what you do, brother. Thank you, bro. God bless you. If you understand that it is information which is going to change your life, then it's extremely important you get hold of the right information. I have a completely free email list, which I strongly recommend you join, available at cobratake.com.